Episode, I think, 21 of the uh, EGA webcast series, our first for 2023. So uh, thank you for joining us on uh, tonight's episode. Uh, a lot of you we saw in person recently, and we want to thank you from uh, the bottom of our mushroom-filled hearts uh, for coming along and making EGA Garden States the event that it was. So many people put so much time into it and so much content was recorded from that as well, which you'll be able to find on EGA's YouTube channel. Uh, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, uh, not just to the YouTube channel, but also to the EGA newsletter, where you'll be able to stay up to date with information. You'll get information about latest video releases. There were a couple more uh, that came out today. There is a whole playlist uh, covering all sorts of Australian mushrooms. So if we don't cover on tonight's broadcast uh, all the content that you need, then you can find it on YouTube. Uh, I'm broadcasting tonight from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and would like to pay my respects to elders past and present, as well as anyone who might be tuned in today or in the future to the recording. I'd also like to recognise that we benefit from the knowledge and insights of First Nations people here in Australia and uh, around the world. My name's Nick Wallace. Uh, I'm co-founder of Australian Psychedelic Society. I uh, used to produce a program on 3CR, but I found myself uh, knee-deep into events uh, with my cover uh, current work and harm reduction. Last week, the International Harm Reduction Conference was here in Melbourne. Um, massive event, good networking opportunity, and it was great to see some colleagues doing excellent work overseas. But that's not what tonight's about. Tonight, on our Microdose episode, we'll be uh, spreading spores for amateur foragers and professionals. Professional, uh, professional mycologists alike. If this intrigues you, if you want to know better what to do out there in the bush, how to take care of things, what to pick, what not to pick, uh, then tonight is the session for you. And I have a whole range of guests that I'll introduce shortly. Uh, emerging research around psilocybin assisted psychotherapy, drug law reform, ecological sustainability, harm reduction, and mycological research all intersect with the needs and values of our ethnobotanical community. And also just want to give a quick shout out to my community who ran, uh, from what I hear, but I uh, was unfortunately unable to attend, uh, a pretty successful mushroom festival in, uh, in mm, was it Dalesford? I'm looking for a nod from people that you can't see. It was no, not Dalesford. It was um, <laughs> it was in regional Victoria, and I hear it went rather well. And I wish I could have been there. If you were there, uh, drop some comments in the chat. Let us know um how it was um and uh w what your favourite experiences there were. Um, please. Uh, well, actually, we'll be going to uh, a video first. I'm just uh, having a look. What else uh, do I need to tell you about? Just to subscribe, it's really important. We'll be running probably not monthly webcasts uh, for 2023, but we do have some other plans up our sleeves um, and are looking forward to those congealing, which sounds like what custard does in the sun, but they'll congeal, they'll come together, and um, hopefully we'll have some pretty exciting new plans now that the world feels slightly less topsy-turvy. Uh, I think I'm going to cross to our first uh, our first presenter, Rich Harity. Um, Rich uh, is presenting to us tonight. Uh, oh, well, let, uh, let, let me tell you about Rich first. Uh, you would have seen Rich uh, interviewing uh, Douglas uh, Rushkoff at the EGA Garden States event. Uh, that was my favourite personal uh, talk and an amazing interview, and it was really a pleasure to watch the both, both of them in conversation. Rich has written for a number of online and print publications over the last decade, while also acting as a film critic for several radio broadcasters and podcasts. His interests focus on psychedelic science, new media, and science oddities. Rich completed his master's degree in the arts at the University of Melbourne back in 2013 and was chair of the Australian Film Critics Association for two years between 2013 and 2015 before joining science and technology news outlet New Atlas in 2016. Since joining the New Atlas team, Rich's interests have consider uh, considerably broadened to examine the error-defining effects of new technology on culture and life in the 21st century. Thank you, Rich.
Hello. My name is Rich Harity and I'm an independent journalist who's been closely following the recent Australian TGA rescheduling of psilocybin and MDMA. So we're about nine weeks away from scheduling D-Day, so to speak, when the gates open and psilocybin becomes a prescribable drug. So I think now is a good moment to take a look at what we do know and what we don't know about how psychedelic medicine is going to work here in Australia from the 1st of July. At the risk of starting with the obvious, I think it's important to stress how narrow this TGA authorization is. So magic mushrooms are not now legal in Australia and your GP is not going to be casually offering psilocybin as part of a random health checkup. Psilocybin has only been approved by the TGA for treatment resistant depression. So it cannot be offered as a first line treatment. It needs to be offered after several other treatment modalities have been tried and shown to have failed. Unlike other parts of the world that are moving towards legalized psychoactive medicine, Australia has forged a unique path by moving these drugs through a very specific mechanism we have here known as the Authorised Prescriber Scheme. This scheme is not new. In fact, it's been widely used for several years for medicinal cannabis. So in the context of psilocybin for depression, to become an authorised prescriber, you need to first be a registered psychiatrist. You then need to apply for approval through a human research ethics committee so there are dozens of HRECs around Australia. These are panels composed of experts and lay people who review clinical research to make sure it's ethically acceptable. HRECs are often attached to universities or hospitals, but there are also HRECs attached to charities and commercial clinical research organisations. So once you get your HREC approval, the authorised prescriber process is pretty straightforward. You fill an online form with the TGA, it's reviewed and then ticked off. Once you are an authorised prescriber, you can administer psilocybin as often as you need without having to file individual approvals for each individual prescription. All you need to do is send six monthly reports to your HREC, listing the volume of patients you've treated and noting whether you've encountered any adverse safety effects with the treatment. So if you're like me, you probably have plenty of questions right now about how these drugs are going to be administered. And here's where things get a bit blurry. The TGA has made it very clear that its only regulatory role in this process is in overseeing access to the drugs. In the context of this, the TGA explicitly states it plays no role in the development of clinical protocols or how clinical practice is undertaken. In fact, during, an, during a webinar in early March, the now former head of the TGA, John Skerritt, repeatedly avoided all questions over clinical practice, stressing that there will be no strictly defined protocols for psilocybin treatment in Australia. So what this all means is that we have no regulatory requirements governing, governing how psilocybin is administered here. So what is the treatment protocol for psilocybin? How many therapy sessions need to accompany a dose? Who's conducting these? preparatory and integration therapy sessions and who's present with a patient while they're taking the actual drug. All of these questions are currently up in the air. And the TGA is punting oversight of these clinical protocols to the individual HREC that approves each authorised prescriber application. Skerritt has very clearly stated that these are all issues for HRECs and not the TGA. So herein lies what I see as the biggest looming problem for psychedelic medicine in Australia, because you see, not all Atrex are the same. Some are quite stringent and only pass ethics approvals to robust applications, while others are a little looser, offering approvals through web-based application forms with tidy little application fees. The TGA has pointed to a variety of clinical frameworks that it suggests, uh, and I quote, you could expect HREX to consider, for example, a minimum standard of training for therapists involved in these treatments is suggested to be that of a clinical psychologist. However, this is not a regulatory requirement. So could an HREC approve a protocol involving post-drug sessions delivered by a basic therapist or counsellor? Maybe.
a study published late last year is often pointed to by the TGA as the most convincing clinical study that it's seen for psilocybin therapy. And this was a Compass Pathways Phase 2B trial that looked at a single dose of psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. And well, from my perspective, the study was far from a convincing demonstration of the effectiveness of psilocybin for depression. It does offer a kind of clinical protocol that the TGA seems likely to expect as the minimum standard. That study focused on a single 25 milligram dose of psilocybin accompanied by two to three preparatory sessions and two post-dose integration sessions. So while the study did wean all its participants off any antidepressant drugs over several weeks leading up to the active psilocybin session, if we were to crunch the whole protocol down, it could be condensed into as little as about two weeks with a couple of pre and a couple of post therapy sessions bookending a day long drug session. The COMPASS trial did have two therapists present with patients during all drug sessions. And this is something that MAPS also mandates for its MDMA for PTSD protocols, something that for safety reasons, I would probably argue is very important. However, it's unclear whether this will be necessary for psychedelic sessions here in Australia. It's also unclear who will need to be present for those dose day sessions. If the authorised prescriber psychiatrist needs to be present for the whole day long six to eight hour dose, then you can be sure psychedelic therapy in Australia will be very expensive and very difficult to access. But on the other hand, if an authorised prescriber only needs to be present for the moment of dosing, then who will be accompanying patients on these experiences and what types of training will those people need? There are psychedelic therapist training programs rolling out in Australia. Some are limited to those with clinical psychology training, while others have very broad eligibility requirements, offering training to everyone from counsellors to pharmacists to alternative medicine practitioners. It does need to be stressed that none of these training programs are accredited by the TGA as necessary to be involved in psychedelic therapy. The only legal regulatory hurdle that is being put up is that a psychiatrist needs to become an authorised prescriber to prescribe the psilocybin as a drug. So what does all this ultimately mean? Well, it means that there's likely to be very little consistency in authorised prescriber approvals. So different ATREKs, are likely to approve different clinical protocols. And this part of the process really concerns me because how is a patient able to evaluate the authorised prescriber psychiatrist they may have been referred to? The TGA has very strict rules around what information can be advertised around medicines that are under the authorised prescriber scheme. So it will be nearly impossible for a patient to easily understand what the specific protocols are for any given psychedelic therapist they encounter. There are a couple of other important issues that I think are really worth keeping an eye on as these therapies begin to roll out in Australia. And one is, of course, I think the biggest elephant in the room for psychedelic medicine, and that is the cost. These treatments will be expensive. And because the authorised prescriber scheme here is focused on medicines yet to receive formal TGA approval, it means these treatments will not be accessible through Medicare or PBS subsidies. So a single dose psilocybin treatment with the briefest pre and post therapy is still likely to cost at least $5,000. An MDMA for PTSD, which is generally a longer 12 week, two to three dose protocol is likely to cost between 15 and $20,000. So who can afford these medicines and who will initially be, be accessing them? Uh, these are big questions. The other kind of massive issue here is the TGA's refusal or inability to mandate any kind of patient registry to monitor treatment efficacy. So there's no requirement for authorised prescribers to report whether these treatments are working or how often a patient is requiring treatment. The only mandate is that they report any adverse effects. So this will make it nearly impossible to know whether patients are actually getting positive results from these medicines as they get used more and more out in the real world. There will be no centralised data gathering of treatment efficacy, which is kind of crazy. And here we are, a couple of months away from legal psychedelic medicine in Australia. And I think some other speakers tonight will talk about how there are expert bodies being set up 
to try and offer guidance and oversight to practitioners in Australia. And I applaud those clinicians for doing that work. It's important work. But we'll see what happens in the real world because any boards and bodies that are set up will not at all be governed by regulatory requirements, at least through the TGA. So authorised prescriber applications will start coming through around the 1st of July. And I'm sure there are some laissez-faire HREX out there that are ready to feed approvals to applications with protocols that are less than robust, meaning the back end of 2023 is certainly going to be interesting. Um, thanks for your time. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the webcast tonight. Rich Charity there on the EGA uh, uh, microdose. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Make sure to subscribe uh, and check out some of the playlists for lots more information uh, on mushrooms, on all things ethnobotanical. Um, I just want to go across a couple of slides here. This is about EGA. Um, if you have joined us for the first time and you're just learning about EGA uh, now, EGA um, is a, an ethnobotanical organization that has been running conferences for over 20 years, uh, mostly in Melbourne, um, but has uh, friends all around Australia and uh, all across the world. This is what we've got on for tonight. Uh, it's up there. Can't have my arm. Um, and we are going to be crossing uh, now to um, our next guest. And our next guest is uh, Vince Polito, Dr. Vince Polito, Senior Lecturer from the School of Psychological Science uh, at Macquarie University. Vince has a keen interest in understanding how altered states of consciousness can impact on cognition and mental health. And he and his students have studied hypnosis, states of flow, meditation, yoga, chanting, virtual reality, religious rituals, and psychosis. And Vince was also uh, one of the um, first events that I saw out of lockdown here in Melbourne with his uh, traveling show of oddities. So I will welcome Vince now. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Hi, hi Nick, hi everyone, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, I'm Vince Polito, I work at uh, Macquarie University in the School of Psychological Sciences there. And I wasn't really sure what I should talk about for this webinar tonight, so I decided that I would just give a little bit of an overview of some of the work that I've been doing in, um, in my lab at Macquarie and really try and tell a little bit of a story of how we've got to where we are doing psilocybin research. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey. It's a, 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 been looking at altered states of consciousness for most of my academic career, but I've only really been focusing on psychedelics for about the last six or seven years. And so yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about how that program of research has developed and ho hopefully that'll be interesting and curious to some of you. So to begin with, I, I just wanted to kind of take a really broad scope of psychedelic research and think about this question of what is it really that psychedelic research is aiming to discover. And the main thing that we see in the news and that we read about and that most research focuses on in psychedelics currently is on the clinical applications. And so there's applications around mental health and physical health. Largely psychedelics so far have been studied um, with mental health applications. And I'm gonna hear from some of the other speakers later about some of the many trials that are now happening within Australia, but the sorts of mental health issues that psychedelics have been investigated for are things like depression, PTSD, anxiety, different forms of addiction, uh, body image disorders, th those kinds of things. And it's great. I mean, it's, it's wonderful, important research. And the fact that psychedelics are showing signs of efficacy across many of these different conditions is part of the reason that there is this huge interest in the topic at the moment. But there are some other really interesting uh, aspects to psychedelic research that don't get quite as much attention. So uh, another type of research that, um, uh, you know, that I think is, is quite important for psychedelic research is mechanistic research. And so the topics that I've put on this slide are by no, mean but no means exhaustive, but just some examples of some of the sorts of questions and topics that I think fit in these different categories. And so mechanistic research might look at things like what is the role of the altered state that occurs when someone takes a psychedelic and what impact does that have or what are the predictors of 
the different types of outcomes that people have following psychedelic experiences. Another topic of research that we could look at would be cognitive enhancement. This has sometimes been referred to as the betterment of well people. So rather than just thinking about psychedelics as something that has clinical applications or could treat illness, uh, it also seems like there's many, many clues that psychedelics can be used for potentially increasing creativity, changing attentional capacities or learning. These are less investigated topics that I think are quite important. We might also use psychedelics as a way of doing intrinsic consciousness research. And that sounds like a mouthful perhaps, but what I mean by that is just using psychedelics as a way of trying to learn more about how consciousness works itself. So more pure kind of research. So really characterizing the altered states that occurs and also looking at the, the neuroscience of these conscious states. What is, what is psychedelics doing to different brain regions and, and brain interconnectivity? And then the final category I've put here is, is social psychology of psychedelic use. I wasn't as sure what to call this one, but this is questions around the longer term impacts of using psychedelics or having psychedelic experiences. And so things like attitude changes, belief changes, interpersonal relationships. And I kind of feel that as you go from left to right across these different categories, there's less and less research. Certainly there are people looking at all of these things, but the vast um, majority of attention and, and funding and effort seems to go more towards the clinical applications and mechanistic research, which obviously are important, but I think these more green topics are also really fascinating. And these are things that I try and, um, you know, get into exploring in some of the research that I do. So to tell you a little bit more about my research journey into psychedelic, I first um, started looking at the topic of microdosing around 2016 or 2017. And this was a fascinating topic to me because um, when microdosing first became popular, there was this sudden explosion of media stories and internet interest, but there was no science. The, the um, sort of wild, uh, the practice of the, uh, microdosing in the wild, people experimenting, trying these things was way ahead of, of any sort of empirical evidence. And so I was really curious just to figure out what is going on here? Is there really some kind of pharmacological effect or, could, or is this all just placebo and expectation? And so the first sort of stage of my microdosing research was a longitudinal study and it was an observational study. We weren't providing substances. We weren't even getting people to come into the lab. It was all just questionnaires set up in an anonymous system uh, online. We found people who were already microdosing and we got them to do a battery of measures at the start of the study and at the end, and also send in some simple ratings each day of the study. And what we were really trying to work out here was, does microdosing impact people's immediate mood? And was there any evidence of long-term cognitive functioning? And um, we had a really strong interest in this study. We had about 100 people sign up and, and complete all of these measures, which was quite a lot considering that they are having to do something every day for, for about six weeks uh, to just kind of graph out the, the sort of diagram of the study design there. Like I said, this big battery of measures at the start and at the end, and then simple daily ratings uh, of, of whether they'd taken a dose each day and how they felt on a, on a number of different sort of mood ratings. And I won't go into the results in too much detail, but just a couple of highlight results. This is the sorts of things that we found in those daily ratings. It looks like a kind of complicated graph, but basically what it's showing here is that first data point on each graph is like the baseline rating. So the first the first chart there is happiness. You can see a baseline rating of about 3.25. When On the days when people took a microdose, that jumped up to about 3.8. But then the following days, one day after microdose, two days after microdose, it pretty much dropped back down to baseline. And so we had, I've just got these three examples here, but we had a range of these ratings, all sort of showing that same pattern of this immediate boost on dosing days, not much evidence of sustained effects afterwards for those mood states. And then the other part of the um, study was looking at the, the, more, um, uh, the more rigorous cognitive behavioral measures at the beginning and at the end of the study. And we had some pretty interesting findings here. We, we found that people, uh, depression scores and stress scores um, significantly dropped from baseline to the end of that six week period. Um, we also found some drops in um, mind wandering and increases in absorption, which is just a, a type of attentional capacity. And so certainly some evidence that something was going on there in that study. And that was definitely enough to kind of spark my interest and, and get me more interested in this question of microdosing and, and try and do a bit 
bit more investigation into what's going on. And that, um, that study was quite well received. It, um, uh, you know, I got a good reaction from my colleagues, even though I wasn't sure what people were going to think of starting to do psychedelic research. And so I was really encouraged to um, continue on. And the next sort of stage of the microdosing research that we moved into was to try and do some neuroimaging of microdoses. And so this was a really um, an unusual design for a study in many ways, because we were still targeting existing microdoses and we were not providing the substance to them. We were getting people who were already microdosing to come into our day when they'd taken a microdose. And so it was kind of a hybrid between an observational study and a lab-based study. Um, and in this study, we were really looking for um, markers of the acute effects of microdosing. That is, could we find some sort of objective indicators that something might be going on on the days when people microdose? And so we were using this magnetoencephalography brain scanner, which is this you know, big, fancy brain imaging device. We also took blood samples to see if there were um, any indications of microdosing effects. And the other thing that was um, uh, interesting about this study is we adopted a design that was developed by a group at Imperial College in London called a self-blinding design, where we got participants to create a capsule with a microdose in it and a capsule with uh, placebo, so just um, non-psychedelic mushrooms or some other similar material. We provided them with labeled envelopes and they would put those capsules in the envelopes, mix them up and then take off the labels. So they end up with just two black envelopes. And they'd come into the lab on two occasions, one time when they uh, are taking one of the capsules each time. And so they didn't know what they'd taken. We didn't know what they'd taken. And so it was a very effective way of um, having a placebo control without the expense or admin overhead of doing a proper clinical trial. So, yeah, it was kind of this study is a, a, a real mix of like really rigorous methods and analysis, but still uncontrolled dosing. Um, and we're just about to finish this study now, actually. Recruitment is almost complete. We've got about five or six more sessions to, to test, and we'll have the results of this later this year. So that's been quite an exciting step. Um, but uh, I guess even more excitingly for me, this um, has now led to the opportunity to actually conduct a real clinical trial. And so this is sort of the next stage of microdosing research that we're getting into. Um, and so we're going to do a proper placebo controlled, randomized controlled trial. Um, this will be targeting people with moderate depression. We will be providing psilocybin in the study. And so we'll have people coming in for a six week intervention. They'll be taking um, a microdose two times a week. And we've got a whole, whole battery of clinical, cognitive, neural, physiological, and social measures. Um, the, the main sort of research question here is, does low dose, um, is low-dose psilocybin an effective treatment for depression? Um, and it's going to run for a few years. It's quite a big trial. It's a very collaborative trial. I've got some wonderful collaborators from, from across many institutions that are, are working in psychedelics that have helped um, sort of come up with this design and, and plan. We're starting probably June, it looks like. We'll have our first participant in. So everything is just about ready to go. The sort of study design is going to look like this. I won't go through all of the details, but just to give a kind of overview, we've got a number of screening steps to make sure that participants really meet our eligibility criteria. People will then come in dosing twice a week, and we've got, um, yeah, a, a, a similar to before, a big battery of measures at the beginning and end, and then some acute measures on those different dosing days. We're going to do things like put people in a, a driving simulator on some of the days to see if there's evidence of impairment from these kinds of low doses. We've got some other impairment measures and some of the other um, cognitive and social measures as well. Okay, um, so that's really been the trajectory of the psilocybin research program. But to finish off, I did want to just say a little bit about some of the other things that we're doing in this lab. And some of this research, um, isn't specifically on psilocybin or even psychedelics, but something that I've been really interested in is exploring the general effects of altered states. And there's been this huge focus on understanding psychedelics in the last few years, but I think many of the interesting phenomena that occur related to psychedelics also apply to some of these other altered states. And so a big focus of our research is looking at some other situations where consciousness is altered, which is 
interesting in itself, but it also has this practical value, which is that as we develop these methods and measures and approaches, these can also then be translated into psychedelic research. It's kind of, you know, things are definitely changing, but it is still kind of hard to do psychedelic research to get the funding and the access to the substances and the approvals and those kinds of things. But it's much easier to do research on some of these other altered states. And so we use that as kind of like a sandbox or a lab of developing these methods that we then can filter into some of the, the more psychedelic oriented research. So I'll just go through quickly some of the things that, that some of my students are working on at the moment. Um, uh, uh, Abigail Peterson is, is got a really interesting project looking at nature relatedness and do intense altered state experiences change people's level of relatedness and then does that actually translate into changes in pro-environmental behaviors. Uh, the next two students, Spencer and Julia, are, are looking at hypnosis. Spencer has created a really novel uh, online um, intervention that, that seems to deliver hypnosis quite effectively through a web browser, which is pretty new and exciting. And so um, he's doing a lot of work on just um, comparing that to traditional forms of hypnosis. Uh, and then Julia is looking at some of these online hypnosis interventions to see if we can use those to improve cognitive performance and executive functioning and these kinds of things. Um, James Thurbon has got a, a very cool project where he's looking at rapid flicker light and audio stimulation. So this is a phenomenon where um, if a bright light is shone extremely fast, people tend to have some aspects of alteration in consciousness, particularly around um, uh, visual sensory effects. So people tend to experience all sorts of complex visual um, uh, visual experiences, patterns, they, um, feel like they see different scenes moving and things like that. And so he's also going to be doing an MEG study looking at brain activity change um, in response to some of this uh, visual and auditory overstimulation. Amber Bunting has got a really ambitious project where she's looking at all these different theories of self-consciousness and trying to map some of the commonalities and differences across these theories to see um, if we can come up with maybe a more unified framework or if we can use these theoretical approaches to really design some experiments that are more clearly going to test different um, aspects of self-consciousness. And then finally, uh, a couple of honours students this year, Sage Zimmern and Charles McKinley, have, have started a, um, what I think is going to be a really intriguing project where we're looking to see how people's motivations, beliefs, and the context in which they take a psychedelic uh, impacts their, their immediate and lasting experiences afterwards. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. That's what's happening in our lab at the moment. I will finish um, as the very last thing with two quick plugs. The first one is just to say that um, if anyone is interested in these kinds of topics, we do have a really nice program at Macquarie that gets into a lot of the fundamental skills that allow this kind of research. So the Bachelor of Cognitive and Brain Sciences um, uh, might be something that you'd want to check out. And then the final thing is that project that I mentioned, looking at the way people, the way that beliefs and attitudes impact psychedelics is looking for participants. So if you are someone that uh, is likely to be taking a psychedelic in the next six months, we'd love to have you as a participant in this study. Um, you can follow this link here, just bit.ly.mq psychedelic survey or this QR code. Um, we're really trying to get a large cohort for this and um, something that I think is going to be quite unique and interesting about this project is we're really going to try and map out what uh, the sort of different effects that people might have when taking a psychedelic in a festival setting compared to in underground therapy, compared to in a clinical trial, compared to maybe in a ritualistic setting. So we're really trying to get people um, planning to use psychedelics in, in all of those different types of environments and um, compare people's experiences. So it'd be great to have some input there. And I'm going to finish up there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Vince. And uh, I feel like it's the right time at the moment to be uh, studying altered states. It sometimes feels like I'm, I'm the only one who's not in an altered state. <laughs> Uh, and I have all sorts of questions around that kind of stuff. I find it a very intriguing area, and I'm so glad to hear that you are exploring those uh, other altered states that sometimes get pushed to the side in favour of uh, chemicals and plants. Uh, if you do have a question for Vince, 
we will be doing a Q and A with all of our uh, all of our guests tonight at the end of the presentation. So do stick around. You can drop your questions in the chat now. There are EGA members uh, in the YouTube chat, and they will be recording uh, your questions and putting them to our guests a bit later. Uh, let's move on because we have an hour, a very full show, um, and our next guest is uh, Dr. Siobhan Johnson. Uh, Siobhan is a clinical psychologist and nurse originally from Canada. She has worked in the harm reduction. Oh, I just had to. I just had a feeling my microphone wasn't on. It is on. Um, sorry, it's been a while. Uh, and Siobhan is a harm uh, has worked in the harm reduction psychedelic integration space and is currently involved in two psilocybin assisted psychotherapy trials in Queensland. Moreover, she has been involved in the establishment of a Queensland-based ketamine-assisted therapy program. Uh, she is a member of the Australasian Research Group on Psychedelic Science and Australian Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Practitioners and is the secretary of the APS, the Australian Psychological Society. Um, but hello to our friends from the Australian Psychedelic Society who might be in the audience uh, today. Um, also, uh, that's another organisation that you might uh, like to check out. And um, just want to also give a quick shout out to the Melbourne team who have done such a fantastic job of uh, picking up after I uh, uh, felt <laughs> very demotivated after lockdown. So thank you, especially um, Adam and Baden. You guys are doing fantastic work. Uh, but now, Dr. Siobhan Johnson. Uh, talking about psychedelic assisted therapy uh oh the psychedelic assisted therapy interest group oh uh hang on was that a whole title siobhan are you the secretary of the australian psychological society psychedelic assisted therapy interest group or the australian psychological society uh the former i am not quite that advanced to be the latter <laughs> that's that's a long title welcome siobhan thank you thank you so much Okay, so I'm going to be presenting on psilocybin assisted therapy, why and what to expect. Oh, there we go. So in terms oh, of why... Hang, sorry, hang on. We are seeing a blank screen that just tells us that you are screen sharing, but oh. it doesn't have the content. Okay, let me just stop the share for a second and try it again. I'm like down here. Let's get this a bit. While we're, while we're adjusting things. Yep, let me see. Does that come up for you? Ah, uh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Okay. So in terms of why, so psilocybin as a medicine has been found to be physiologically very safe across a multitude of different studies. Uh, it's been found to be a catalyst for mystical type experiences. So these are things like ineffability, transcendence of space and time, uh, tend to have noetic qualities. People can have uh, emotional breakthroughs. And some research has found that they, it does uh, have anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects. Uh, and there's also some research, of course, to show uh, that psilocybin has antidepressant, anti-compulsive, and anti-addictive effects. So there's that transdiagnostic potential, meaning that it might be applicable across a wide spectrum of different mental health conditions and possibly physiological health conditions as well. So why psilocybin assisted therapy? Well, it's my goal that by breaking down the three essential components, it will become really clear as to how much uh, work actually goes into these different stages and phases to try to ensure that people get the safest and most efficacious outcomes. So we start with preparation, then you have the dosing day where you're actually giving the psil psilocybin, of course, and then you have integration. So preparation, it's part of an ongoing screening process to assess psychological preparedness to undergo this work. So essentially, you know, of course, you're going to have your screening procedures. You want to make sure that uh, people coming into uh, the, the psilocybin assisted therapy is suitable to do that work. Uh, but when you're doing preparation, you're also looking to see that they are psychologically prepared. So of course, you know, you would expect some degrees of uncertainty or anxiety, but if that's super elevated or you can just tell the person's really not going to let go of control, that might be an indication that at the very least, it might be a good idea to delay uh, enrolling them in, in the study, or at least in the, uh, to participate in the dose day. Now, preparation, of course, is absolutely essential to building that rapport between the therapist and client. 
And you're going to be negotiating things like therapeutic touch. I mean, in psychology and probably a lot of you know, mental health professions, we're sort of trained not to touch people. But in an, when people are in an altered state of consciousness, they might actually want their hand to be held, for example. And so you can negotiate them uh, with them up front as to whether that would be something that they would consent to. And we do something called the non-romantic uh, handhold. So uh, it's an ongoing uh, process of consent. And so it's a good idea uh, to have hand signals. If, uh, if someone's you know on the dose day wants their hand to be held, you sort of agree upon uh, a hand signal that would indicate that, as well as a signal that would indicate that they no longer want that. Uh, now, setting intentions is, of course, important, but it's important to remember that the medicine, so i.e. the deeper you, it will show the person what they need. So it's really important to sort of roll with it. As we'll see when I get to the dosing slide, concepts of surrender and acceptance are really, really important. Uh, and of course, you know, if you have an Indigenous client, you really want to ensure cultural safety. And so ideally, you would have, you know, Indigenous elder or healer or uh, somebody who's quite experienced working with altered states of consciousness who's there all the way through. All right, so for dosing day, uh, as mentioned, so surrender and acceptance are key. There's actually been some research to show that people tend to have better outcomes when they adopt attitudes of surrender and acceptance. And it makes sense. It's just like any emotion, right? Like the more that you resist it, you avoid it, you try to push it down, it actually grows and it grows and it grows and it becomes a lot uh, more scary. And so you want to actually uh, tr train or I guess inform the person uh, right up front that the best thing to do is to move toward and surrender to whatever is coming up, even if it is quite a challenging experience. It's also a good idea to incorporate ritual. Now, you have to be careful here, of course, because you don't want to be imposing your own religious or spiritual beliefs on people. But realistically, you know, we evolved, uh, or the use of psilocybin evolved around using it in ritualistic ceremonial contexts. And so, for example, on dosing day, rather than just giving someone a pill, you might want to present it to them on, you know, a nice sort of shrine and make it a little bit of a, a ritual, uh, as long as the person's comfortable with that, of course. You also really want to set the scene. So you want to have music uh, while someone is under the influence. And it's a really good idea to incorporate music that doesn't have language that's understandable to that person, because Obviously, in an altered state, people are quite suggestible, and so for their hearing uh, lyrics, that can really influence the direction with which uh, the experience takes them. Uh, it's also a good idea to think about incorporating things like essential oils, having nice smells uh, in terms of lighting. So you wouldn't want these really bright lights that I'm subjecting myself to right now, the um, more yellow uh, ambient Type of lighting kind of sets sets the mood so you know things like salt lamp can can be really nice to have and again we evolved using these substances in nature-based settings so it's a really good idea to incorporate nature into the room so you want to get some plants or maybe some artwork um, that is uh representing some form of nature uh there's a concept of the inner healer right that we all have this deeper a wiser part of ourselves. And so we want to encourage people to actually keep their eyes closed and help to direct their attention inwardly. And with psilocybin, you know, you get all of these pretty incredible closed eye visualizations anyways. So it can be quite a beautiful experience to do that. Uh, now, transference and countertransference, that comes up in any sort of psychotherapy but in the context of uh, altered states of consciousness, uh, we find that that might be even more intense. So, for example, it's not uncommon that when somebody is under the influence of a psychedelic, that they might uh, misperceive the therapist as their mother or their father. And in the uh, grief trial that I'm involved uh, with, we've discussed the possibility of the client uh, thinking that perhaps, you know, the therapist is their deceased loved one. So how do you manage that? So it's a good idea to work with your team to role play, you know, different scenarios that can come up. And then, of course, you know, with counter transference, the therapist has to be very mindful not to project their own emotions onto the client in inappropriate ways. 
And then again, you know, if you're working with an indigenous client to ensure cultural safety, you want to have you know indigenous elder, healer, someone experienced with altered states of consciousness. Uh, as somebody who is not of indigenous background, I can have a lot of empathy for intergenerational trauma, but I don't have that phenomenological experience. So having somebody in the room who has that lived experience can really help to bolster that cultural safety. So integration. Uh, so as Nick had highlighted, so I, I did a bit of you know harm reduction integration work in the past, and often uh, what I would use uh, were what I would call integration journals. So when people are under the influence of psilocybin or really in any kind of altered state, it's just like a dream. You know, you can have symbols, archetypes, certain insights that come up. And like a dream, uh, it will fade pretty quickly. So it's a good idea to write these things down uh, as soon as possible. And so what I would do in the past is sort of review what the person had written. And I would, you know, derive, for example, a guided meditation if they had certain insights or, you know, symbols, imagery that came up to bring them back into that experience, I would uh, basically create, you know, guided meditation based on uh, what they had written down. Sometimes it would also be really useful to identify certain therapeutic modalities that might be uh, useful to help integrate what came up from them on dose day. So, for example, if it's evident that, you know, parts of a person has, has surfaced, then you might use something like internal family systems therapy or schema therapy, where you do parts work. If someone, you know, had a lot of insight around acceptance, maybe you would use an acceptance commitment therapy type of approach or radical acceptance from dialectical behavior therapy. I mean, really anything, right? So it's really important to be quite flexible and creative as, as therapists. And it can be really helpful then, of course, to be trained in a multitude of different modalities uh, to titrate the therapy to the client's individual needs. With integration, you can, of course, also use artwork. Uh, and nature, because again, you know, we evolved uh, using psilocybin in the context of taking it outdoors. And so it can kind of take people in that natural direction to want to connect with nature more deeply. Now, I've always thought of integration as a word and a form of harm reduction rather than a novel therapy. Uh, as APRA registered clinicians, and I'm sure sort of other uh, mental health professionals working in the field, we have to work within the confines of evidence-based therapy. And so when I think of integration, uh, if we take the example of, you know, whatever came up in the integration journal, we're taking that content and integrating it into normal waking consciousness using pre-existing evidence-based frameworks. I think of it as harm reduction. The best way to explain this is I like to use an example, you know, if you had a client who came in with ADHD and uh, we know people with ADHD tend to have lower dopamine levels, they might find themselves more likely to self-medicate with substances like cocaine. And so not only would you be exploring the harms associated with their cocaine use, but you would also want to get an understanding of what they're actually getting from their use of cocaine. What needs are they trying to meet? Now, I'm very aware that cocaine and psychedelics are quite different, uh, but hear me out. The purpose of me saying this is that I have actually seen people abuse psychedelics. Um, the risk there is that it, people might be under the impression that the only way to uh, meet the needs that they've you know, identified while in that altered state is to continue using psychedelics. And that's where things can become you know, a little bit riskier when people are sort of out, you know, using it on their own. And I'm not saying that, you know, people can't have good experiences that way, but obviously, you know, the more and more that people are doing it, then, you know, the higher the, the risk potentially. And so just like the example with ADHD client, you would want to get an understanding of what the person's needs are and then using uh, evidence-based, you know, sober means to meet those needs helps to reduce those harms. Now, virtual reality uh, has also come uh, into the field as a form of integration. There is uh, an Australian-based company called Enosis Therapeutics, and so they've created a psychotherapy tool in VR for psychedelic integration, and it records the insights from the participants as they emerge from the psychedelic experience. 
So they're then able to return to these insights and build on them, creating uh, the mental model within the VR scenario, which serves as an ongoing dynamic permanent record of the evolving psych uh, psychological state throughout therapy. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, and of course, we want to, again, be very aware of cultural safety when working with Indigenous clients. And that poses an interesting question there. I remember reading a paper a couple of years back uh, looking at the uh, incorporation of virtual reality uh, in, in, in the realm of psychedelics. And one of the points that was made was that from an Indigenous perspective, you know, these have very primordial roots. And again, you know, these substances like psilocybin were used in, in very naturalistic settings. And so with virtual reality, that's uh, so, it's such a, a, a different way of doing it that um, some Indigenous people may actually uh, see that there's a lack of sacredness to it potentially and be quite offended by that. Um, but that's not to say that the two can't meet. Um, I was talking to a colleague recently, and I know that there are some people in the field who are looking to sort of incorporate the two. So it can certainly you can still uh, incorporate cultural safety into VR. It's just perhaps you know a broader conversation to have. And look from my my perspective, integration never ends. You know, it's our life work. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly touch on the current trials uh, that are being. Uh, undertaken in Australia. So just the psilocybin trials. And from here on in, I'm just going to refer to it as PAP. So at the moment, there is a uh, PAP trial for end-of-life distress that's just wrapping up in Melbourne. Uh, Australia's largest uh, trial at the moment is a multi-site trial for treatment-resistant depression, and they have sites in Melbourne, Hobart, and we've just opened one, uh, a branch up in Brisbane. There's the PAP for methamphetamine dependence in Sydney. Uh, there is our grief trial that I had uh, briefly mentioned. So we're looking at the use of psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy for prolonged grief disorder. There is PAP for anorexia nervosa. You, of course, have the PAP for generalized anxiety disorder. And then you have uh, the PAP for major depressive disorder uh, happening in Perth as well. And if I miss any, I apologize. Those are the ones I'm aware of. All right, so just to finish off, I'm just going to uh, touch a little bit on uh, the rescheduling. So as mentioned earlier, you know, the TGA has rescheduled psilocybin from a Schedule 9 to a Schedule 8 for treatment-resistant depression. And so, so some of my colleagues and I uh, have, you know, some concerns, uh, for example, just around infrastructure. So I went into a bit of detail about all of the detail that goes into the preparation, dosing, and integration phases of this work. And I just talked about it in a very general sense. There's just so much that goes into it. Already in clinical trials, there's a lot, but when you're dealing with altered states of consciousness, it's just these little nuances, like things that you just don't really even think about until you're in the thick of it. And so what we don't want to see happen is, is for this to roll out too broadly, such that, you know, people are just kind of taking it in any kind of clinic without any consideration of, you know, set and setting. Uh, and then, of course, you have cost considerations. So for safety and pragmatic reasons, uh, therapists are working in what we call a dyad. So you have the two therapists and obviously that costs money uh, and, and you have to have a psychiatrist on board as well. And for most mental health care plans, people are using better access you know, mental health care plans and they've now eliminated the COVID plan. So that only gives people 10 sessions per year. And by the time you get through screening and preparation, I mean, that's already a big chunk of the sessions. So what we might end up seeing is that we're creating a situation where this medicine is only really becoming available to affluent populations. I'm not saying that there aren't ways around it, um, but it is a risk. And then, of course, you have, you know, training and credentialing considerations. Uh, as it stands, there's no accredited training program in Australia. There uh, are some training programs and some training programs being developed, but nothing accredited as of yet. And there are certainly no credentialing uh, guidelines. So in response to that, uh, a group of us have sort of banded together to create the Australian Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Practitioners. 
And so I'm just going to read what I had uh, generated about this so that I get it right. So we, it was set up and developed by practitioners, including psychiatrists, medical doctors, psychologists, nurses, paramedics. We've got some psychotherapists. If I'm missing anyone, apologies. Um, social workers, of course. Uh, initially, our focus has been on safety and governance. And personally, I'm on the credentialing subcommittee in which we're formulating credentialing guidelines for professionals hoping to do work in this space. So we're basically trying to do everything we can uh, such that, you know, the rollout of this is done as safely and uh, effectively as possible. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Siobhan. Um, that was really good to hear, especially about uh, your concerns. Um, I know uh, if you've got any kind of involvement with a psychedelic organisation and you've got an email, then you've probably been receiving email after email of people desperately seeking uh, therapy because they haven't been able to find any solution among the traditional um, selection. But I've also heard stories of people who have found underground therapy and unfortunately ended up in a much worse situation because of the lack of skill of the practitioner, their inability to recognise uh, really important signs or have the ability to deal with difficult scenarios. And um, it does seem, I, I mean, having watched TGA decisions over the past decade, this was um, out of character for the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is often quite conservative. Um, they're a bit of a brick wall. It can be really frustrating. And even though the arguments have for a long time been on the side of exploring psilocybin, um, they, they are our uh, a national regulator. Um, it is important for them to consider all sorts of risks, uh, potential for harm. Those are the right things to be considering about these sorts of uh, substances not when these substances were first scheduled here in victoria uh the concern was uh at the time um and this might have been the bernie finn um of of his day um who's a uh ridiculous politician here in victoria um but he was worried about some of the wavy designs that were turning up on burke street in some of the uh strange shops among the youths um yeah we have silly people among us still. Uh, thank you. This is uh, the uh, EGA microdose. Um, I don't know if we're still calling, calling it gun states microdose. I'm looking looking to Ronnie, the wizard man, who I can see, but he's a wizard, so you, know, you can't see him. He's um, using magic. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to introduce our, our next guest uh, on tonight's uh, microdose, the first one of 2023. Make sure to subscribe to the EGA YouTube channel for heaps more content on mushrooms and more, um, and to subscribe to the EGA newsletter, which I'll get one of the uh, EGA members in the chat to drop the link uh, into the chat so that if you are not subscribed, you can jump on that. Also, just want to give uh, the whole EGA team uh, a pat on the back. It's going to take a while because oh. I'll have to do it uh, a little bit um, at a time. I've only got two hands. Uh, we are over 10,000 subscribers on the EGA YouTube channel. It's been a little bit of a goal uh, for a while. So thank you very much to everyone who has pressed subscribe. Don't forget we are doing Q&A at the end as well. Uh, but do drop your questions in along the way. We are collecting them, collating them and preparing them to be asked to uh, those with answers or at least something to say. Uh, our next uh, guest tonight is uh, Simon. Um, and I'm going to... Grab some Simon uh, bio, Simon Beck, um, who has some very, I, I remember last time we did this, uh, some very uh, entertaining, uh, slightly disturbing stories. I can't remember if you shared them live or if that was maybe part of our after chat. Uh, Simon is a micro enthusiast with over 10 years of experience foraging and eating many different species of fungi on Australia's east coast. Simon enjoys targeting new species and seeking out new locations for hunting. He has a particular interest in psilocybe, <laughs> I'm going to say that different every time, uh, and other psychoactive species and helps run the P-Mans, that's with a Z, uh, group on Facebook, uh, on Meta's Facebook. He has previously guided educational groups in the field, teaching others the basics of fungus identification and plans to continue to do so into the future. Yeah. Simon's uh, academic background is in medis medicine and psychiatry, and welcome, Simon. 
Thank you, Nick, and thanks, AGA, for another great event. Um, Siobhan and Vince, thanks so much for your talks. I'm learning a lot listening to you both. Uh, and I am going to talk a little bit about set, setting, and making the most of your psilocybin experience. I'll point out that this is a harm reduction presentation. I'm not condoning or encouraging any sorts of illicit activity. Uh, and if anybody wants to shoot any questions through to me or make contact for any other reason, there's my email address down the bottom there. I am also the secretary of the Australian Psychedelic Society, the other much smaller APS. Um, so please get involved in supporting our volunteer run organization as well. Check out our YouTube channel and resources sometime when you have a moment. I wanted to try and present a fairly condensed uh, set of things that you should consider when you are thinking about taking psilocybin uh, mushrooms, particularly for the first time or when you are just starting out. So I've tried to go with a who, what, where, when and how format of this to make it as easy to remember as possible. Um, I'll just go through these and talk about some of the aspects that I think people should really give some consideration to when they're thinking about taking a psychedelic. Uh, this doesn't just apply to psilocybin, I think it applies to any psychedelic that you might be thinking about exploring. Um, and I think that the best way to get the most out of your experience is to prepare properly so that you minimize the chance of having a or challenging experience. Not that difficult and challenging experiences can't also be turned into a positive, but they can be at times difficult to process. They can be traumatizing and particularly where you are somebody who might have some psychological issues or some unresolved tra trauma. Um, without adequate preparation, they can be sometimes quite confronting and potentially harmful as well. I think it's important to recognize that while they're physiologically safe, generally speaking, there are psychological risks associated with their use and preparation is the best way to mitigate and manage those risks. Um, so in terms of the what, it's important that you know what you are taking. Um, and I know that sounds really obvious, but in Australia, we have several different species of mushrooms that are particularly common, um, those being Psilocybe subaeruginosa, which grows from wood-loving substrates in the cold weather, Psilocybe cubensis and Panaeolus cyanescens that grow from dung in the warm weather. Um, and the, the dose range and the potency of these things is markedly different. So for subaeruginosa and Panaeolus cyanescens, the dose is something like half that of um, typical cubensis. Um, so it's important to know what species you're consuming, especially if you haven't picked it yourself and particularly if you're buying it from somebody. Um, cubensis are commonly cultivated and sold in the underground, but subaeruginosa because of their common availability out in the wild are also often sold. Um, so it's really important to know if you are sourcing it from somebody else to ask them what species it actually is. Uh, a mushroom isn't a mushroom. There's a massive difference in dose. Uh, and something uh, potentially a difference in the nature of the experience as well. Um, the strain, if you are taking cultivated cubensis, can also be quite important because there's a lineage of strains from the Penis Envy cultivar that can be one and a half or two times more potent than a typical cubensis um, strain. So really worth knowing exactly what strain you are getting as well if you are purchasing them from someone else and bearing in mind that if you're growing them yourself, uh, it's important to know that the strain can make a difference in terms of the potency. I mentioned there whether it's a known or a new batch. And the reason I say that is that within the same species, potency can also vary quite a lot, um, fairly significantly. And some people will often tell you that they've been out in the bush and they've taken one tiny little mushroom and it's absolutely blown their minds. And sometimes you need quite a few mushrooms for it to have any significant effect. So. Um, I think the best harm reduction advice around that, uh, what's recommended is to take multiple doses, put them together in a way that homogenizes them so that you have a batch uh, representing multiple doses and then starting low and going slow and getting familiar with the potency of that particular batch. Um, some people would draw. Oh, um, Simon has just, uh, has just um, left, left us and on to robot land we'll just wait a moment um hopefully simon will be back with us um I, at the moment i'm just seeing his frozen face uh we are hearing from simon beck on uh some of the important things to consider um around 
uh, a if, if you are deciding to indulge. And I was just uh, typing in the chat that my uh, first ever experience was um, from a single mushroom um, that was <laughs> handed to me through the slot that you deal with uh, um, console operators, servo servo people in the middle of the night uh, by some um, particularly. Uh, sideways friends um and um and yeah that uh, that i mean it was the first time trying something and i always I mean, maybe uh, uh vince might be the uh, right one for this sort of question but i think if it's the first time experiencing something where i have nothing to compare it to maybe that's part of the reason why it stands out rather than it it sort of objectively stands out it looks like we have simon back um simon how are you going Good, my apologies. The internet was working fine for the entire hour and a half that we've been talking together and just yes. had to drop out while I was actually speaking. Um, so my apologies about that. Oh, yeah. Hopefully it'll stay stable from here on out. Telling us your uh, bandwidth is low, but um, let's go. Thank you. All right. Let, let me know if there's any other problems. Um, what I was saying was when you have a new um, set of mushrooms, it's a good idea to combine multiple doses together into a homogenized batch and then start low and get familiar with that batch um, just because the potency between different specimens can vary so much. So we don't recommend eating individual mushrooms um, because that potency variance can be so significant. If you and your friends split up a number of fresh mushrooms and just eat, you know, a, a particular weight of whole specimens, the experience that you end up with, even if it's from the same patch, uh, may be quite different. That's probably less of an issue when they're from the same cultivated batch, but if you're picking them out in the wild, it's worth bearing that in mind. And then of course, dose is going to be sort of the, the most important factor of the nature of the experience that you end up having. Um, and there are dosage charts and guides available online, so I won't go into that too much, but it's just worth bearing in mind that a lot of the dosage guides you'll see published are about Cubensis. Uh, if the dose range goes up to five grams, it's talking about cubansis, five grams of subregionosa. Um, and, and when I say five grams, I mean five dry grams. Uh, mushrooms usually weigh about tenfold uh, wet what they do once they're dried. Um, so do bear that in mind as well. If you're eating fresh ones, you need to um, consider the fact that that's a very different dosage range to when you're using dry ones. But double check dose range online for the particular species that you're taking before you go about starting to have those experiences. Um, the next important thing to consider is the uh, aspect of where you're taking them and perhaps where you shouldn't take them. And I think the number one thing to bear in mind there is safety and security. Um, this is particularly important if you're thinking about taking them out in nature, which obviously is a really tempting place for you to take them. It's where you'll often be picking them. Um, but there's obviously risks associated with doing those things out in the bush. And in those situations, I think it's particularly important to consider some emergency planning for if things do go wrong. Um, and particularly important to have somebody sober around who can actually drive for help if need be, particularly if you're out of mobile reception, which frankly, most of rural Australia is, um, as you can tell from my internet connection. Um, so I think just it's, you know, you don't necessarily need to focus on the possibility of things going badly, but it's always a good idea to prepare for that possibility um, and have some plans in place for what you and your friends or the people who are taking them with you will do if that does happen. Um, consider comfort. You know, the experience is going to be a lot uh, more pleasant if you're comfortable while you're having it. and. Some of the things to consider there is the, um, you know, having having the place set up for you, having comfortable couch, comfortable cushions, uh, having jumpers, being able to get warm if you need to, having some light and easy to consume food, particularly things like fruit around for if you do um, feel like eating something or starting to feel a little bit dark in the experience. Sometimes a little bit of sugar can really help with that. Um, really simple intervention to start trying to bring things back on the right track if they're starting to go a little bit awry. Um, have plenty of water available. And, um, you know, the other thing with comfort is familiarity, particularly when you're just starting to explore these things, being familiar with the environment that you are in can really help shape the experience in a positive way, it removes some of the anxiety, it um, just has that, that sense of homeliness and familiarity. Um, and I think when you're starting out, it's probably wise to start in those familiar settings like a, like your home or, you know, a friend's home, rather than being somewhere completely unfamiliar, like out in the bush or at a party or something like that. And consider any distractions that might 
pop up, um, particularly if you have responsibilities like children or pets, uh, you know, work that might call you in at odd hours, things like that. It's just really important to make sure that those distractions aren't going to get in the way of the experience because once you are under the influence, you're unlikely to be able to deal with those things all that effectively and they can generate an awful lot of anxiety if um, unexpected things pop up. The other thing is things like loud noise, flashing lights, that sort of stuff in terms of distraction um, and Siobhan covered some of this in terms of how they set up rooms for psychedelic assisted therapy is to just try and minimize the level of distraction that could present itself during the experience. Uh, in terms of thinking about when you are going to take it and perhaps when you shouldn't as well, things to bear in mind are your mood and any recent major stresses or ongoing stresses and any pending major life decisions. Um, the nature of the experience can really be shaped by those aspects of what's going on in your life more broadly and it's worth giving serious consideration to whether that is the right time to engage in one of these experiences. I know that a lot of people use these substances to try and address issues with their mood or try and uh, deal with major life stresses or perhaps even try and get a perspective on um, where to go with a major life decision that they're facing but um, particularly if you're not familiar with these substances, those things can be really anxiety provoking. Uh, and often if you're in a difficult situation like that, I think all the more important to consider doing some more formalized preparation, be that with the psychologist or some active self-directed um, preparation to consider uh, how you're going to deal with those thoughts when they do come up during the experience yeah. and probably uh, an even more important thing to have a sober sitter with you, who you're familiar with, who you're comfortable with, who can help ground you if things start to get a little too anxious, if things start to go a little bit dark into a difficult place, um, who can maybe bring you back into a more positive mindset during the experience. Um, the other things to consider there are aspects like any major medical problems that you're experiencing at the time. Um, if you have things like a, a heart condition where your heart rate might go up at random times, um, those sorts of things can produce anxiety during the experience as well. Gastrointestinal issues, you know, uh, mushrooms, psilocybin and some other psychedelics can have some pretty significant gastrointestinal effects and if you've already got issues in that area that are worsened at that particular time, um, sometimes these things might make those feel a little bit worse and take your mind onto more difficult um, thoughts, making you think or focus on those medical issues that you're facing. So worth bearing in mind how you're going to deal with those experiences if they do come up. Combinations with other substances, um, I think, are, you know, best left out of the picture unless you're quite experienced with these things already and particularly things like alcohol, um, you know, I think lots of people have been in the situation where you're at a party and you've been drinking and somebody has some mushrooms or some other psychedelics and there's, you know, maybe an impulsive sort of proposition to take those at that point in time without any preparation, without any real thought given to how that experience is going to turn out. And those will often turn out to be messy, difficult and, you know, potentially not so positive experiences. So I think, um, you know, oftentimes best to leave those those things out of the picture, particularly when you're less familiar. Cannabis is another one, you know, a, a lot of people use cannabis and um, a lot of people can find that that can generate some anxiety while they're on a psychedelic. So just worth thinking about how you respond to the other substances that you might use during the experience as well and trying to consider how the use of those other substances might interact with the psychedelic and shape the experience. Um, and then there's the issue of substance withdrawal. If you do have substance dependence issues, um, some psychedelics can last quite a long time. And during that time, depending on your level of dependence to other substances, you might start to enter into a withdrawal state. Um, that's obviously going to be quite anxiety generating and produce a whole bunch of unpleasant physical sensations. So have a management plan in place around those if that is an issue that you think that you might face. Um, and responsibilities, um, you know, if you have to go to work at four o'clock the next morning, then taking mushrooms at 10 o'clock at night probably isn't a very sensible idea. If you have to pick up your kids the next day, um, you know, you might just want to give some consideration to whether you, whether that is really the time to be engaging in these sorts of experiences. Um, thinking about who you're taking them with and potentially who you shouldn't take them with is another really important factor. 
Uh, and again, I think safety is a critical thing there. Um, as has already been mentioned, in some underground facilitator environments, there's been a lot of reports of uh, unacceptable behaviour. Um, you know, breaching sexual boundaries, breaching personal boundaries, that sort of thing. Um, you really need to know that you can trust the people that you are taking these substances with, that you can rely on them to help you if things get difficult um, and that, you know, that they're not going to try and do anything that puts you in a difficult or uncomfortable situation or, or traumatises you quite deeply, as can often be the case. Um, think about the relationship you have with the other people that you're taking them with. If there's unresolved issues with some of those people, if there's some tension in that relationship, um, sometimes that just can increase the chance that things are going to be a little bit more difficult. And again, some people take these substances with their partners to try and improve the bond or work through some relationship issues. But unless you're quite experienced with the substances, that's something that's probably better um, done with some facilitation from somebody else who both parties can trust to help them through that experience. Um, and, you know, again, just adds to the complexity of the situation. So it needs to be considered beforehand. Having a sober sitter is always a good idea. It's always something that's recommended. I know that it's not something that's often practiced, but um, if things do get out of hand or go down a difficult path, having somebody there who's sober and can help you is a really helpful thing. Sometimes if you can't have somebody come and be there in person, it's a good idea to just let somebody you really trust know that that's, you know, that you're planning to have one of these experiences and ask if it's okay, if you need to, can you get in touch with them? Um, you know, make sure that they're available for you to give a phone call to, or they might be available to come around if things start to get out of hand, um, I think is a really good idea. Even knowing that somebody is there uh, to help you through a difficult experience can help reduce the chances that you have a challenging experience because there's a little bit of safety net reassurance in the background. Um, and the other thing is the expectations and the intentions of the other people that you're considering dosing with. Um, if you're really looking at having a deep, personally therapeutic, personally meaningful experience and they're more interested in just having some fun and enjoying themselves and you know playing some games or whatever um then you, you're sort of already starting off on a, a a bad footing to have a difficult experience because they're going to be thinking about it and approaching it and behaving in a very different way to what you might want to so it's important to establish beforehand what exactly they're planning to do while you're on it and uh, what their intention out of it is um, so that you can make sure you're all on the same uh, same footing before you go into it and why are you taking it is also a really important consideration. Um, the aspect of intention is particularly important if you are planning on having a, a therapeutically directed experience where you're trying to address some particular personal issue or something that you're facing in your life, maybe trying to gain a different perspective on some issue that you, you've been experiencing. Um, and in that case, it's a really good idea to do some preparation beforehand, um, you know, a lot of which Siobhan covered before, around thinking about where you want to take your mind during the experience, um, as well as how you might bring yourself back if that gets a little overwhelming. Um, and there's a lot of psychologists out there now that can actually help people do some of that preparation work beforehand. They won't be doing the dosing session with you, but they can help you prepare for it, particularly if you are going into it with a therapeutic mindset for yourself to deal with some particular issue. Um, expectation is another aspect, which is, you know, a, a, a sense of what you expect to happen that you're projecting onto the idea of the experience. And I think a lot of the time, particularly when you're just starting out, it's good to have a fairly broad and open mind in terms of what the experience is likely to be like and try and go with the flow rather than being very concrete about what you plan to get out of it. Um, and I think that's the same regardless of whether you're trying to just have some fun with them or whether you're trying to have some therapeutic uh, intent with the experience. Um, the less rigid you are in thinking the experience needs to go a particular way, the less likely you are to be upset or distressed if it doesn't happen to go that way. And just remember during the experience that there's always another opportunity. Um, if things aren't going the way you were expecting them to or hoping them to, try and go with the flow and remember that, you know, this isn't, that the mushrooms are readily available, that they're, they're everywhere. You will have another opportunity if that's something you decide you want to try again. And integration is really important, um, be that some self-directed integration, as Siobhan said, using journaling, um, trying to think through the experience, make sense of the experience, create meaning out of the experience, because often the 
messages that you receive while you are having these experiences aren't super specific um, and they often require some meaning generation afterwards in terms of looking at what came up while you were having the experience and trying to put that in a you know frame that in a way that makes sense for your life and what's going on for you so that you can um, act in a way that maximizes the benefit you have from the different perspectives that came up during the experience. Um, and again, some psychologists now will also help with both the preparation and the integration after the experience, even if they're not present during the experience, which can be a really useful thing, particularly if you're going into it with therapeutic intent. And I think is uh, especially important if you are somebody who has some psychological issues and is trying to address some of those using these substances yourself, having that professional support and a bit of structure around how you prepare and integrate the experience can be really, really useful and help maximize that benefit. And how to handle things if they do start to get dark. Um, have a think beforehand about how you might ground yourself if things start going in the wrong direction. Um, a lot of the time people will do that by seeking something familiar, um, be that an object, an item, a smell, a sound, some particular music that puts you in a really good frame of mind that has some positive emotional memories associated with it are all really useful ways to become grounded. And I've heard of some people grounding themselves if things start to get, um, you know, a little unusual or a little out of hand or they start to detach a little bit more from reality than they wanted to by reconnecting with what's actually going on in the real world. Um, and as odd as it sounds, sometimes something like turning on the TV for a brief moment uh, and just realizing that that's going in real time and that other people out there in the real world are watching the same thing um, can help sort of bring you back to that sense of, uh, of reality um, and recognizing that you are still alive and real and part of the, the real world on a broader scale can be quite helpful. And then there are things um, like meditation, mindfulness, that sort of stuff that if you practice beforehand can be really useful during the experience to, to ground yourself. Um, and rescue strategies as well. I won't go into it in any detail, but um, some people do use certain medications to either reduce the anxiety if it gets really out of hand or to completely abort the experience. And benzos and antipsychotics are sometimes used in those situations but obviously if that's something you're planning on doing you need to check that that's a safe thing to do with your doctor based on your medical history and any conditions that you might otherwise have as well. I'm certainly not recommending that anybody doses any pharmaceuticals of their own accord. And just a brief mention of wood level paralysis, Kane who's speaking shortly um, and I have done a survey about this and I think it's worth mentioning because it seems like it's actually not as rare as maybe we would have thought initially in Australia. It's um, caused by psilocybe subaeruginosa here. It's a transient loss of skeletal muscle function that can really vary in its um, severity from minor loss of the use of the fine muscles in the hand to a complete paralysis of the whole body. Um, it usually comes on and off in fairly short waves, but the time to onset can vary a lot. Some people actually only first notice the weakness way after the psychedelic effects have worn off or even the next day, which is really important to remember um, if you're taking um, the wood lovers to bear in mind that even the next day uh, you should probably avoid driving or operating machinery or anything like that because you might notice at some point that you start to get some weakness that can really be quite impairing and we had quite a number of people in our survey report some very dangerous situations that had arisen because of this. Uh, it's not limited to a particular substrate or habitat that we could tell. Um, patches that have caused it before are seemingly far more likely to cause it again. So if you have picked from a particular spot that's caused this and you don't want it to happen again, it's best to probably avoid that area in terms of where you source your mushrooms from. Uh, the compound responsible definitely survives drying and is definitely water soluble. So it doesn't matter whether you're having them fresh or dry or in a tea or with a lemon tech, it can still happen. Um, and as I've said here, it, it um, might be particularly dangerous when other causes of respiratory depression are present. That's things like alcohol, opiates, benzos. If you've got an underlying lung condition that makes it difficult for you to breathe, or if you happen to fall in a position, uh, you know, face down on the ground and that impairs your respiration further. Um, so I think with wood lovers, it's particularly important to give yourself that time the day after not to need to do anything like driving. Um, you know, don't jump on a push bike, try to avoid crossing roads and um, even more important to have a sober sitter with you. Um, so I hope that gives a bit of an overview of some of the things that I think should be considered in terms of minimizing the harms or the risks potentially associated with using psilocybin or other psychedelics. 
and maximizing the benefit that you might get out of them as well. Thank you very much, Simon. That was a fantastic summary. And it sounds like uh, you've got it all uh, memorized in a nice uh, pattern there as well. Uh, that was that was really good. Uh, and it, there's also been some uh, fantastic uh, chat in the uh, in the chat section, some questions coming in as well. Uh, thanks to everybody who has been chatting away. I did notice that uh, somebody made the comment that um, uh, psychedelics uh, or psilocybin is where you uh, experience real magic. And uh, I thought that was an interesting one. Again, one I think uh, Vince might have something to say about. But um, I, I think I agree with you, but um, in, in uh, like the probably the opposite way uh because for me that experience just showed me how fallible your sensory array is how how much it can be fooled just by small amounts of chemicals um how much you can experience um a a world that is not necessarily relevant to the physical uh structures around you um and it just makes me think of um simple tricks just uh sleight of hand type magic because that's somebody who uh, knows and has practiced really well at tricking your sensory array and giving you a different idea about what's going on. Our final guest tonight before our Q and A, so to get those questions there, uh, is Kane Barlow. Kane has uh, a lot of videos on this YouTube channel on a range of mycological subjects. So please, uh, if you are interested in uh, the content tonight and you need more, uh, check out the YouTube channel. Look for that mushroom playlist, and you'll be able to find lots more info there. Uh, Kane. Um, I'm going to welcome in just a moment. Um, Kane, thank you for being here tonight. Kane is a mycologist and fungi, fun, fungi, fungi. It's only you guys that make me like self conscious of how I'm pronouncing these. So um, I hope, you know, some are tuning. It's just going to, it's going to be in my head forever. He's a mycologist, a fungi educator, and he's based in Melbourne, although he spends a lot of time in Tassie too. He gives regular talks on mycology, fungi, uh, conservation, and teaches gourmet mushroom cultivation. He's a member of the Australian organisation Xenthiogenesis Australis. Um, uh, myco Munity Applied Mycology, that's Myco, all in capitals, and then Munity, like Community uh, Applied Mycology, the Australian Psychedelic Society, and the Entheome Foundation. Kane posts regularly on his Instagram at Gorilla Mycology. That's Gorilla like, hey, I'm doing stuff in the bushes. Not Gorilla like, hey, I'm doing stuff in the book. Not the best example. Sorry about that. Uh, sharing adventures from cultivation, foraging, and ethnomycology to interesting oh. observations from his home lab. Kane, welcome. Oh, you got to say words or it goes to crazy town. He's, he's on mute. I am. <laughs> Thanks, Nick, for that great intro. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, if I can find my screen. Uh, can everyone see my slides? Surely can. Excellent. That's good. Uh, so tonight I'm going to talk about Australian psilocybe species in a context of kind of like a foraging aspect. Uh, so yes, so my Instagram and my website. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands from which I'm speaking tonight the traditional lands of the Malakadi people of southern Lutruweda. Uh, so I'm currently in the Huon Valley in Tasmania. Uh, so I acknowledge the custodians of plant and fungi knowledge, uh, those who have passed down their wisdom to us. I think particularly in the context of, of plants and fungi, it's important to acknowledge the incredible amount of knowledge that has been passed down to us from time immemorial you know, and I, and this certainly comes into the context of foraging here, you know, if this knowledge has been passed from one generation to another generation. And to some degree that's been lost, I think in the last couple of hundred years with this kind of vast culture of food and living. And, and certainly I'm a, I'm a huge fan of foraging as, as part of a slow food. Let's get back to nature. Let's 
look at the knowledge that is there and, and that we can pass on. Uh, and also, and help conserve. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So I'm going to begin by talking about foraging. Um, it's, if you're into fung fungi, this is something that we do. And I guess there is a context of foraging or foraying. Many mycologists will go out on forays, but that's, that's a very observational activity. You observe the fungi, you might interact with it in the context of identifying, but you, you're not picking fungi. So we kind of bring this into the foraging space, I guess, tonight. Um, yeah. <laughs> if foraging is an ancient art, uh, it can also be a very idyllic experience for many. We're going out into the forest in this context, into fields. Um, we're very, very close to nature and, and it's just, it's a lovely activity. It's a lovely part of our life. It's something that's nice to bring into your experience. There's, there's a few things to kind of make note about with respect to foraging. Um, it's important to take a few things with you, what to carry with you, uh, a basket for collecting your, your fungi. If you're collecting fungi, you know, like your saffron, uh, saffron milk caps, your, your birch bullets, uh, what else? Lapista nuda, all these incredible fungi. They're out there at the moment, particularly in Tasmania at the moment. I've been having a great time. Um, but baskets also help to, as not only to hold what you're collecting, but also for distributing spores. Um, uh, uh, kind of a nice, important thing to do. Carry with you paper bags. Uh, these are important in context. If you're collecting different things, you, don't, you may not want them to get mixed up. You might be collecting a fungi from one spot and a fungi from another spot. Try to keep them separate. You might find that maybe some species, some fungi are slightly different in their, maybe their composition than others, and you, you want to keep them apart. Uh, take a pen by writing on those plastic bag, paper bags, so you know where they came from in the future. Take a knife, good to clean off your fungi. Take a backpack to carry all the things. Also carry appropriate clothes, a hat, a raincoat, good shoes, water, food, snacks. I'm not sure. You know, certainly when I go foraging, I'm out, I'm out for a long time. <laughs> I get a little lost in the forest sometimes and it gets very echidelic for me. Uh, I love it. Take an ID guide. Uh, have a printed mushroom guide with you in your backpack. A book, for example, or these flips, the new kind of flips that are becoming very, very popular at the moment are great. They, they fit in your pocket. Uh, the cheaper ones are easy just to fold up and put in your back pocket as well. Tell people where you are um, as a general guideline. Um, and, and try to tell them to look, I might go this track, but I might also kind of go in a, a slightly more diffuse area. Have your phone. Not only is it great for taking photographs and, and trying to help ID what you're maybe looking at. Um, but it's also, if, in, if something does happen, you, you have a means to contact people. Uh, and now I'm going to go into some guidelines around safety and etiquette with respect to origin. Um, there's a certain element of care and respect for fungi. Uh, so a lot of these ecosystems that we go out and walk within are, are quite delicate. They're very, very intricate webs of fungal and plant and animal interaction. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. So be careful. Uh, identify before you pick. Uh, don't go just picking any, any fungi willy-nilly, you know, Get down there, get close to it. Look at the stem, look at the gills, look at the cap. Uh, have an ID guide close, you know, either your book or your fungi flip, or even iNaturalist to see if you can identify that mushroom before you actually start picking it and, and the other fungi around it. Some fungi are weedy uh, and care should be taken not to disturb them. Uh, the orange. Uh, ping pong bat fungi, for example, is one to, to not be touched. It's a beautiful, pretty thing, but try not to disturb it. It, it will spread spores. You can get spores on you, on your clothes, on your shoes, uh, and you might carry them to then other places. 
where they could then potentially cause a problem. Uh, there's certainly a big dispute about cutting versus pulling of mushrooms. Uh, certainly from scientific evidence, there doesn't really seem to be any big difference. Um, it's up to you what you want to do at the end of the day. Um, but pulling, gently pulling, certainly does seem to indicate uh, that it helps promote mycelium. Uh, but like I said, do it gently. Don't also rip up the whole network of the mycelium that are there, particularly like with wood chip beds, for example. You know, the mycelium can be really tough and can pull up heat to cluster the wood chips with it. Only pick what you need. Uh, many fungi fruit multiple times over a season. Uh, take what you time, take what you need for that time period and maybe go back later on. Um, you don't have to take them all in one go. And also consider tissue culturing uh, the, the fungi to, to grow in perhaps a more controlled environment. Uh, you know, we don't have a clear idea of the diversity of species out there and, and some things may be quite special. You know, there are Ganodermas out there, for example, that may not have been necessarily identified. If you're foraging, maybe take a small sample and, and try to do a tissue culture and grow it out. Uh, there's lots of really good uh, mushroom growing workshops out there that you can attend. So, uh, and many people, you know, will happily uh, demonstrate how to do this kind of thing. Care and respect for the environment. Uh, slow mushrooming, mushrooming. Uh, be gentle, be deliberate. Uh, don't just, you know, tramp through a spot. See if you can step in gently and pick the mushrooms that, that you're you're looking at, you're, you're trying to collect. Uh, leave no trace. Uh, kind of similar. Where, where possible, step gently. Uh, and and don't, don't leave too much rubbish. Take home what you take in with you. Uh, minimize taking easily broken glass. Uh, take empty bags with you to collect rubbish. And then there's care and respect for each other as well. Uh, foraging for foraging is a is a really peaceful and and it's an activity of relaxation for many. You know, it's you know, going out into the forest and making lots of na loud noise and, and disturbing the, the peace, you know, be, you know, problematic for some people. So I recommend going in, be quiet, take your time, go slowly, peacefully, and tread softly. Uh, so if you're picking on your own, as I've already stated, let others know where you'll be. If you're picking as a group, make sure you look, at, look out for each other. If people kind of wander off, uh, you may get separated for a while oh, and lose each other. It does happen. Um, and as I've already stated, be mindful with respect to waste. Another thing too is try to avoid common names. Uh, certainly, you know, like, I guess the really good example here is gold tops. When you're talking about gold tops, you know, gold tops, depending on where you are in the country, can refer to many different things. Um, and something that I've noticed lately that I find a little interesting is, is people starting to use made up nicknames. Uh, and I feel that this is probably slightly problematic when you start using nicknames to refer to things because, you know, what do you, people may not necessarily know what you're talking about. It could potentially be dangerous. I'm going to change tack a little going from foraging generally about uh, edible fungi and jumping into uh, a bit more of the, the topic tonight. Uh, so we're going to talk about the genus Solosophy within Australia. Uh, there's quite a few species present within Australia. There's the temperate species, uh, Solosophy subarugonosa, Solosophy elutacea, Solosophy semilanciata. Um, if you go through the EGA playlist, there's already videos present to, to describe Many of these. Uh, there's also the subtropicals, uh, Solosophy cubensis and Solosophy papuana. We're noticing on Facebook the emergence of some new species. There's uh, Solosophy, I first refer to it as Sp Tasmaniana. A lot of people refer to it as Solosophy Tasmaniana. 
but this has not been conclusively uh, connected to the original Tasmaniana collected by Watling. It's, it's beginning to cause a little bit of confusion, particularly as the species grows out of the range of the original. There's certainly now a feeling that it's its own species uh, and that perhaps we should start paying attention to it and, and actually uh, fully describe it. There's the emergence of Solosopis samuensis as well uh, on, in northern New South Wales and into southeast Queensland. It's becoming uh, quite a common species. Lots of people collecting it. Uh, and there's also Solosopis angulospora that are turning up in, in uh, pot plants and whatnot. Allied species, there's the Paniolus and Gymnopilus, which I'm going to talk about now. So allied species, so in temperate areas, there's the Gymnopilus species. Uh, there's also the Amanita muscaria as well. Subtropical allied species, Paniolus cyanescens and Paniolus cinctulus. So in general, guidelines around identifying psilocybe. Uh, so psilocybe means bareheaded, and that refers to the separable gelatinous pellicle, uh, which I'll demonstrate briefly. It's a bit of a mouthful, I know, and, and people kind of are like, what are you talking about? Um, but I'll show you briefly what that means. Uh, Caps of psilocybe are hygrophonous, and they often change color as they dry out. They can start out as really quite dark brown or quite often caramel brown. And over time, we'll, we'll dry out and fade to a, a lighter yellow color, and in some cases, even white, uh, which can be slightly confusing. Uh, the taxa was named Agaricus tribus solosibi by Elias Magnan Fries and then elevated to genus by Paul Camus. Uh, until 2009, the genus solosibi was synonymous with the genus Taconica, which kind of raises a bit of confusion because if you go through some of the older books, you'll find like all these psilocybes uh, that are no longer present. And that's essentially because a lot of those psilocybes were moved then into Taconica or into other groups. The type species uh, was Psilocybe montana, uh, which is now Taconica montana. And as of 2009, the type species is now Psilocybe similanciata. This is the species from which Psilocybe is, is defined. Some brief mushroom features for taxonomy just as a reference for what I'm about to launch into. So we have features like the umbo, which is this kind of little peaked bit at the top of the cap. So the cap, uh, also known as the paleus. Uh, Solosibi also often have veil remnants. This is these uh, beautiful kind of white remnants around the margin of the cap here. Uh, there are the gills. Uh, quite often starting out as, as kind of yellowy, creamy in color, and in time changing to uh, a mottled kind of brown or, or black. You have the partial veil, cortina, uh, which is where the, the veil remnants come from. You have the stems, the stipe, and then down below you have the mycelium. A useful feature of, of psilocybe is, is this really, really dense, thick mycelium that does kind of hang off the base of, of the stipe, particularly the wood-loving uh, psilocybe seberinosa. This is that separable pellicle. Uh, you can see it, it's very gelatinous in its look. Uh, it could, not necessarily tough. You can, you can stretch it to some degree, but it does rip quite easily but it's a really good feature to be able to identify your psilocybe using. Uh, so this is a psilocybe similanciata, uh, and this is the separable pellicle uh, from psilocybe cubensis. So one of the two main species within Australia uh, is psilocybe severiginosa. Uh, it's synonymous with Solosophy australiana and Solosophy eucalypta. Uh, and I'm being a little cheeky tonight because I've updated this slide and I'm hoping Alistair is going to jump in on this. 
because uh, I certainly think it's pretty exciting stuff, but uh, it's also highly probable that it's also synonymous with Solosophy Cyanesins and Solosophy Azuresins. The habitat for this species is wet and dry eucalypt forests. Uh, so eucalypt, uh, so within eucalyptus and also pine plantations. It can also be found in wood chip garden beds, found in Tasmania, Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, Southwest Western Australia, Southeast Queensland, New Zealand, uh, geez, Southeast, Southwest Canada in the Pacific Northwest, and then I guess running down the the uh, the Western Seaboard of the United States, uh, UK. It's gone. If if this news uh, synonymization is correct, and it's it's certainly starting to travel the world. Uh, the season, uh, April, May to June, July, August, uh, climate permitting, depending on where you are. Uh, it does require a cold snap to fruit, so and that transition being somewhere between six to eight degrees C. Although it's kind of interesting that some of the northern populations don't seem to need that quite that same drop they seem to be fruiting at a, at a higher temperature and that's that's kind of interesting the kind of forest that we're looking at is wet sclerophyll so uh, lots of eucalyptus um, antarctica sonii uh, and and another number of other species as well but also dry sclerophyll particularly in midwinter when this gets quite wet and that uh, all that, that detritus debris on the ground gets really quite not quite wet. The cap, usually one to six centimetres, uh, it starts as a caramel brown colour, drawing to yellow. Again, that hygrophonous change in the colour. The cap is conical to convex, uplifting in age uh, with that prominent umbo. Uh, the gills, the attachment is adnate to add next. Stem can be anywhere from 4.5 to 22 centimetres long, um, and even longer. I mean, in 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 areas where there's lots of nutrient within the soil, they these can get really large. Uh, the stem is quite firm, white, very very fibrous in texture, turns grey with age, and brown uh, when waterlogged. Uh, it has a white partial veil that disappears, or sometimes. Uh, leaves a trace. Sometimes really quite thick, quite a thick uh, partial veil around the margin of the cap, as per that photograph earlier. Uh, and these bruise strongly blue when damaged. So these are the gills. Uh, so they're, they're quite crowded, uh, cream colour when young, and, and a grey brown in age to almost even black. Add next, to add next attachment. Uh, and but you do get cases where sterile specimens, the, the gills will remain white. So here's some examples. Uh, here, down here in the bottom right-hand corner is, is that really quite uh, uplifted sinuate kind of phenotype that some, some specimens can achieve very close to solosophy cyanesins. Um, some cases, yeah, very, very prominent umbos. In other cases, not, not so prominent. Another example, this is uh, a dry sclerophyll that's kind of starting to get wet in about midwinter and, and the mushrooms are just popping up everywhere from, in this case, they're, they're growing out of this, this log. Um, in areas where there's lots of nutrients within the substrate, uh, they can become quite clustered. And another example of Velocity Sveriginosa, showing many of those features already talked, spoken about. Another important aspect is to discuss the lookalikes. Uh, of which there are quite a few when it comes to Solosuisa veriginosa. There is the Gallerina species. Uh, these are poisonous, potentially deadly. Uh, they contain the same compounds as it, that are in death cap. 
Uh, it's, it's particularly important that you look at each specimen, uh, and make sure that the features match the described features. Particularly with Gallerina, um, they can grow right next to Solosibi sibiriginosa. Hypholoma species can also grow right next to Solosibi sibiriginosa as well. Not quite as dangerous, but they can be poisonous. Quaternary species, poisonous, also potentially deadly, uh, can cause quite a lot of harm. Uh, they're not as close in appearance to Solosibi sibiriginosa, but they can grow in the same habitats. Uh, and because of some of the coloring, people will confuse the, the, the natural blue coloring of some areas for the blue bruising of Siberiginosa. Uh, so come midwinter on some of the Facebook groups, we're often quite busy identifying uh, many area species that people are collecting, uh, thinking that they're, that they're Solosibi. So again, just, you know, Learn to know the features of what you're looking for and learn to know the features of what you're not looking for and be sh make sure that you're, you're looking at each specimen as you pick. Other lookalikes that are probably uh, less poisonous, but worth keeping an out for, uh, eye out for are Foliota species, Protostropharia semiglobata, which is quite common, uh, some Gymnopyla species, uh, and Loradiomyces cerez. Uh, which is poisonous. Uh, and interestingly enough, Loradiomyces cerez was, was originally known as Zolosibi cerez. They're not necessarily a very close lookalike, but they certainly appear in the same habitat. And in the photograph here on the right-hand side, again, they're growing right next to each other. If uh, you're in a really darkened kind of environment, you could quite easily just be uh, picking these two species and, and not necessarily noticing. Jump into Solosibi cubensis, the other main species within Australia. Habitat is open grassland. Uh, this is an introduced species. Uh, and again, I'm sure Alistair is probably going to talk about uh, his recent kind of findings with respect to the, our really fascinating populations of cubensis here in Australia. Uh, these are found growing from cow pies, so cow dung, but also sometimes horse dung as well. They're known to grow from horse dung. Uh, and sometimes they grow from grass itself, from, from soil that's really, really well manured. So the dung is broken down and, and spread, but the nutrients still there, still uh, present for the fungi to myceliate and then to, to fruit. Cubensis require rain and humid conditions to fruit. They're found in uh, Queensland and northern New South Wales. Likely Northern Territory and, and Northern WA as well. Uh, and I guess on that point, it'd be really nice to start seeing some evidence, uh, even though people are reporting these there, but there's currently no evidence to show that they are, but because these are associated with cattle, uh, it makes sense that they, they are likely there. The season for Solosophy Cubensis is generally in November to February, but it, it can stretch uh, each way. And depending on where you are, yeah, February is probably an early call. It can stretch out to... I think April in some places. Here's an example of the difference in age between specimens uh, showing the gills and the stipe. The specimen growing in open grassland on dung. Another one growing on dung. Uh, so for Solosby commences, the cap is conic to convex. Uh, there's an umbo. They're red and to brown when young, changing to golden yellow with age. And, and in some cases, they're in kind of a slight blue color coming through. Uh, the universal veil remnants can remain on the cap. The gills are attached 
Uh, so the add nate to add next, uh, they're close, uh, they're narrow to slightly wider at the center, palette to gray in color, uh, dark purple to black in age. The stem uh, is whitish to yellowish with age, uh, with a persistent annulus. Uh, and you can see that in the specimen here on the, uh, on the right hand side. Here's a photo of the gills. Uh, they're close, narrow to slightly wider at the center, pallid to gray, dark purple to black in age, mottled uh, with the edges remaining whitish uh, with an add nate to add next attachment. Uh, here's a series of specimens. You can see the difference in age here going from the younger specimen on the left hand side to the older specimen on the right. You can see the the color change in the cap here, and particularly on the on the right hand side, there's the blue is is starting to come through there, the kind of blue gray. Uh, so lots of Kavensis lookalikes, uh, so Strafaria species, Agrosomy species, uh, Candeliomyces candolianus, uh, Bobidius tichibens, Protostrafaria semiglobata. Uh, and Deconica species are, are all potential lookalikes. And finally, I guess some things to keep in mind with respect to the law uh, with private land, it's, it's universal to not remove plants or fungi from private property without the owner's permission. Uh, so we highly recommend that you don't trespass. Uh, go and seek permission from the landowner. Um, gifts can go a long way. Uh, so, you know, perhaps gifts of I don't know, chocolate from wine to beer. Um, if if you know the landowner, that, that makes that a little easier. Uh, in the case of national parks and and public land, in Australia, uh, any removal of plant or fungi is illegal without a permit. So do keep this in mind. Here's a list of some useful field guides. Uh, some of these are listed in the um, Entheogenesis Australis resource. Um, oh. I can't remember the title. Maybe someone can chuck it in the in the chat. I think this is a mycology reference guide uh, with with lots of guides listed. Certainly for within Australia, um, the field guide to Australian fungi by the recently deceased Bruce, Bruce Fuhrer is definitely a very very helpful guide. Uh, and the more recent wild mushrooming uh, by Alison Pulio and Tom May is definitely a great resource. Australian organizations and websites. Uh, so many of these groups uh, discuss fungi, uh, discuss foraging, uh, and they'll have great resources to, to help. And that's pretty much me. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, me. Um, but you are pretty much. Uh, and we actually do have one last speaker tonight. Thank you very much to Kane. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there are a wide variety of resources that uh, Kane has contributed in or just directly developed uh, available on the EGA website. Uh, you can get there by uh, let's see if uh, let's see if this works. Um, uh, have to reprogram a bunch of numbers. Um, uh, oh, there we go. Um, and I need it. I need a screen now. Give me a bit of. This one, nope, not that one. Oh, that's my secrets. Uh, yeah, that's what I want. EGA's website, okay, head there, resources. Uh, let's go to fact sheets quickly. Reference guides, that's where you might want to look. A reference guide to Psilocybe subaruginosa. And there's also uh, cacti information there, reference guide to cannabis concentrates and more. There's always more information coming out. Um, EGA also has the uh, 
plant uh, combination matrix, uh, which we got to see for the first time ever at the Garden States broadcast in December last year. Or oh, Garden States real cast, sorry. There was a broadcast too, um, but there was a lot more real cast going on. And uh, DanceWise have actually been taking that along to some festivals and events alongside the Tripsit banner with a more common array of uh, chemical, uh, well, uh, more 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 componenty uh things than uh complicated things yeah that feels right i'm going to introduce our last speaker for tonight who i apologize i forgot earlier i wrote down a list i clearly did not check it twice um and uh uh i guess i've been naughty because our last guest um is somebody who has been um well Getting naughty with mushrooms a little bit himself, if I dare say. Uh, Alistair is, has been <laughs> studying mushroom sex. Uh, look, I'll let him explain it because he's going to do it far less crudely than I. Uh, we've had um, Alistair on for two previous webcasts and live uh, in person. I think you were in person or were you on our live? Yeah, you were and he's nodding to me um, at the uh, EGA Garden States event and has been progressing with his research and hearing more about it each time. So I'll welcome now um, Alistair with um, the sub update. Welcome. Ah, thank you, Nick. Your warm, your voice is just so warm. I'm Alistair. I've been working on magic mushrooms for the last two years. It's just been a breath of fresh air from my old work or normal work on plant pathogenic fungi. And the work on mushrooms that I've been doing is done on the smell of an oily rag. So I need to thank, or I want to thank everyone who's helped me along the way, particularly the landowners and the people who've been out there collecting and sending me more than 250 spore prints just last year. Tonight, you will see the hard work of people like uh, Kane, Nigel, uh, Dave H, Jan, Snoo, Bill, and Tim S, who've been sending me subs from all around Australia. Just so helpful. Um, Bioplatforms Australia, they've added some oil to that, to that uh, not very oily rag. They helped sequence 85 genomes of Psilocybe subaruginosa, which I got back just one day before Christmas. They've just released a new funding announcement. It's called the Fungal Genomics Initiative. If you work in the mycology space and you have a want to sequence a proteome, metabolome, transcriptome, genome of any fungus, then check it out. Uh, they could be able to support what you want to do. I'd also just like to acknowledge my co-authors, Tim, Jason, Kevin, and Steve. Uh, I like to think of myself as a fungal geneticist, but more as a tourist. I go around and maybe I send you a postcard from where I'm exploring. Whereas someone like Tim, he lives there and breathes genetics and he's like the QC for um, the quality control for whatever I'm doing. So let's get to it. Kane already touched on a lot of this. Gosh, this is like a little deja vu of what he was doing. I just want to really give you a little bit of background about the history of subs or maybe more about how people choose to name fungi so mycologists or taxonomists there's a they have to do justice to biodiversity there's a fine line between describing too many names for a particular fungus or too few names and not not doing justice to biodiversity so too many names you kind of start to to lose the power of a name and every new population becomes a new name Whereas when you don't have enough species, then you're missing out on diversity. So people, when they look at mushrooms, they're microorganisms. They don't have that many characters to go from. And the reason that mycologists will start to describe new species is based on morphology. So these subs over here, we've got a typical flying saucer mushroom, a nice wavy cap. And then uh, the ones that we've seen lovely photos of similar to Tanner's photos that were in Kane's talk that uh, we're also, we know and love. So people will see differences and they'll describe a new species of mushroom. So phenotypic differences or ecological differences, fruiting time, substrate. They'll describe new mushrooms when they appear in new places and, and maybe they'll go, okay, well, this deserves a new name. And right now, the gold standard for applying a new name in taxonomy is a phylogenetic species hypothesis or phylogenetic species concept. This is just based on one or two genes, sorry, 
one to more genes. It can be uh, lots and lots of genes. And you're essentially comparing your taxon in question, its phylogen, its evolutionary relationships based on a phylogenetic hypothesis and seeing if it is one thing or another thing that is comparable in its sequence data. And we'll have an example of that later on if you have no idea what I'm talking about. So yeah, there's uh, a little bit of excuses in the history of mushrooms that look like Psilocybe subaruginosa, where people have thought, well, hey, we should slap a new name on this thing. So when it's been introduced internationally and we've ended up with a handful of names like cyanessens and azurescens and uh, alenii that uh, have been named from the Northern Hemisphere that look suspiciously similar to Psilocybe subaruginosa, or people have even split within Australia and New Zealand, applied new names, and then we've had new names applied also based on sequence differences in the ITS region. So some of these more recent um, names are based on differences between ribosomal DNA genes. So the genes that encode the structure of the ribosome. So with all of the sub data that we have, which is about 85 genomes or 86 genomes, no, it's more than 90 genomes, we can start to test hypotheses. And the hypothesis that I'm testing is that Australia is the center of origin of these wood loving magic mushrooms. And if you've been to one of my talks before or seen it, you will have seen this funky diagram. This is a split tree. It's actually a split tree of a psilocybe, uh, the relationships among psilocybe cubensis. And it's just here so that we can practice for when we see the real deal on subs. So a split tree is just a way to visualize the relationships among genomes. And in this case, it's 124 genomes of psilocybe cubensis, uh, sequenced from around the world and in Australia. The little circles at the ends of these edges or branches are actual genomes. And the difference or the branch length that connects them, two things, that is informative of how different they are. So that is conducive, that is indicative of genetic difference. So this network is based on 250,000 differences across a genome. So you can see something that I've never kind of uh, explained in any of my talks is that things like this, this little four that I'm kind of circling with my mouse, I hope you can see it, is those are siblings of Psilocybe cubensis that has been printed. And then I've taken spores from the same mushroom and growing up cultures, those are siblings. So you can see that even in from one mushroom cap or pileus, thank you, Kane, for that beautiful word, you've got these siblings that are still quite genetically different, which is an indication that uh, of heterozygosity in our Australian genomes, especially when you compare them to this uh, pink color over here, which is the golden teacher kind of population or that I've named the golden teacher population. And I can't see because I've got a big long list of big thing of faces down the thing down my screen, but there's golden teacher, be positive, Maui, um, McKenna, all these popular names are essentially the same thing genetically. There's very little genetic diversity among them. So even less genetic diversity among all these strains than among siblings of Psilocybe cubensis in Australia. The other thing you need to understand about split trees, split trees are trying to display all of the relationships among data and complex relationships like this, this lots of reticulation or reticulation at the bottom of this Australian group is usually a sign of recombination, though there are other reasons to explain it, other ways to explain it. So this reticulation may mean that golden teacher has been hybridized with things like blue magnolia, malabar, blue cystic, and new genetic diversity, uh, sorry, new strains have been produced from evolutionary innovation by crossing, by crossing different strains. Okay, so that's, that's it. That's cubes done, and you're just getting practice. So in your minds, have a little think about how a split tree might look if Psilocybe subaruginosa is different to these Northern Hemisphere taxa, things like Psilocybe cyanescens and Psilocybe azurescens. Probably, if you did the exercise and your homework, you would be thinking of something where there's a really long branch connecting Psilocybe azurescens or Psilocybe cyanescens 
and Psilocybe subaeruginosa is totally different to them. If they're different species, we certainly wouldn't expect cyanescence and azurescence to cluster within or among Australian populations of Psilocybe subaeruginosa. Now we're going to get to a split tree next slide after, and you're going to see some color. I just want to explain where that color came from. This is essentially a structure plot, and it's me trying to work out how many populations or how many groups are naturally present in that data. This is just from a small data set of about 7,000 differences among those genomes. So each vertical line is one individual uh, haploid mushroom or haploid culture. And each horizontal line is adding a population. So if we started with there's these numbers down here, like K numbers, if we started at K equals one, there would only be one color. When K equals two, we're adding a population. And I can tell you that the Queensland population comes out and everything else would be the same color. So we're gradually adding more and more potential um, groups to the data. And when we get to around K equals eight or K equals nine, we start to get some nice solid lines and we don't have any breakup at around beyond K equals 10, 11, 12. We start to get this real substructuring in these, um, in these nice looking groups. So that is where the colors in the next slide come from. So here is a split tree of Psilocybe subaeruginosa. And one of the first things you'll notice is that Psilocybe azurescens and Psilocybe cyanescens down here in the bottom right, both cluster within or among um, Psilocybe subaeruginosa collected from Australia. So definitely not what we would expect for two taxa that um, you would consider different to subs, okay? Uh, the next thing that we'll see that I want to talk about, this I've always explained this terribly as well. So in this... Similar to the cubes, we've got siblings. So ravens born, this is all from one mushroom. This is five different siblings, haploid siblings. From the Bunya Mountains, I actually have about three or four different mushroom caps, but they appear as siblings. Kane has done a lot of collecting and he keeps his uh, mushroom caps or pilii separate. So things from Kunyanyi are from individual mushrooms. So you can see that these are siblings. Uh, Ellendale, which was collected by Jan, are true siblings. So you can get, you're starting to get a picture that uh, each of these little clusters of groups is from the same mushroom. So they're really, really closely related. And then they branch from a bit further down. So a lot more uh, genetic diversity present beyond just in one genotype that's probably, sorry, from one bed of mycelium that's making all these kind of uh, really closely related siblings. One of my favorite things here is this Geelong and Clifton Hill. So two different parts of Victoria, one collected by Kane, one collected by Bill. Thank you to you both. And we see that they almost have a sibling relationship. Kane's definitely a siblings. Bill's probably not. Um, and I believe this is from transporting mulch throughout Victoria or wood chips throughout Victoria. And you've got this genotype that's kind of invasive and it's sort of uh, shed some light on what might have happened to introduce Psilocybe azurescens or Psilocybe cyanescens to the Northern Hemisphere. We haven't sampled. If we kept sampling from New South Wales and maybe more from Eastern Victoria, we'd really expand this wagon wheel of this network and probably we end up sampling from the original, if not the original, a really closely related genotype to these ones in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, I think that's all I need to say about that network. This is relationships among the ITS region of those 86 genomes, maybe not all 86 made it in there. And then a whole bunch of um, ITS sequences I've just downloaded from GenBank. So this is a dichotomous hypothesis of evolution. It's not a split tree. It's showing one potential, um, one potential hypothesis of, of sister relationships among all these little individuals. So the squares are from GenBank, the circles are our data. Now the goal of these kind of, or applying a name is to have a monophyletic group in taxonomy, which just means that if you've got Psilocybe subaeruginosa, you want it to all come from one most recent common ancestor and everything from that most recent common ancestor is a sub. 
when you start breaking up a group with cyanescens or azurescens or weraroa or alenii, then it makes psilocybe subaeruginosa paraphyletic in regard to those taxa. There's a few solutions you could describe more and more and more to reflect intraspecific diversity of ITS, which is not a good solution, or you call everything psilocybe subaeruginosa. You can see here that just from our splits tree before, we've got all these red dots, which is Victoria, South Australia, uh, Tassie. Oh, I forgot to say, yeah, that population is kind of divided by a range. It's too late. I'll let it go. But you've also got ITS types from that same population in other parts of the tree. So ITS is intraspecifically variable among uh, Psilocybe subaeruginosa in Australia. It is not, it's a great marker to say, hey, this is in the subaeruginosa complex, or this is Psilocybe subaeruginosa. It's not the best marker to start dividing up Psilocybe subaeruginosa into new species. One thing that is interesting, and it's sort of hidden by this UQ brand here, is that this is Psilocybe macarorae, its sister to the complex. I actually, I didn't really make a, a root. I just did a midpoint root, but it is different to everything else in there. It actually differs by 11 base pairs to this clade. So at some point in time, a taxonomist, definitely not me, uh, will have to decide whether everything is subaeruginosa and macarorae is sister or whether this is all um, subs. <laughs> okay, I just want to show another little piece of evidence about why subs are native or uh, the center of origin is in Australia. And I've always explained this terribly. So this time I've made a figure. Now, the city of Mycota, uh, mushrooms, they have an inbuilt genetic mechanism to help them outbreed, and it's called tetrapolar mating. And it means that, that at two different independent spots in the genome, the control mate compatibility. And so the example that I've just made is on the left here, we've got one locus, the PR, which is the pheromone receptor locus. And it can either be a positive or a minus. And in a parent, you would have a positive and a minus allele. And each of its four little basidiospores would get one each of those. Sorry, we'd either get a positive or a negative. And so a positive, same thing with uh, everything in mating, opposites attract, a positive can cross with a negative. So in bipolar mating, which is when you only have compatibility controlled at one locus, you can cross with 50% of your siblings. Tetrapolar mating, so easy. You're just introducing another locus. And in this case, it's the homeodomain locus, the HD locus. And really, it's the exact same thing. You've got a parent that has these positive minus, positive minus at HD and PR genes. And the uh, offspring each get this makeup uh, either a pos positive, 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 minus, minus, positive, minus, minus. And you can only cross when you differ at those loci. So in tetrapolar mating, you can only cross with a quarter of your siblings. Oh man, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> so in cubes, that PR gene, the pheromone receptor locus, it's responsible for when hyphae meet, they can recognize each other. They go, hey, well, we're the same species. and we differ. Let's let's get this on. Let's let our hyphae fuse and, and we can start seeing what cooks from there. So in cubes, we resolve that there is, this is just the Australian population. There's pretty much three alleles. This one's a little bit more complicated. There might be three alleles just within that one. So maybe there's six alleles at the PR locus. And we know that the Australian cube population is actually pretty diverse compared to the cultivated populations. In fact, the cultivated populations really only have two pheromone receptor alleles when you look across those 100, and 100 or so genomes. So let's take a look at what um, the diversity looks like in subs. And we've got heaps of alleles of the pheromone receptor locus. And it's because uh, in the center of origin, you expect the most genetic diversity to occur. It's where things evolved. Uh, you want to be able to outcross, so you want to differ at this locus. 
Um, so it's in its interest over time to differ at the locus. And we would expect the center of origin to have a lot of diversity here. In support of a hypothesis that everything that we've looked at is Psilocybe subaruginosa, if we think back to our structure plot and our split tree, the bunya clade up in Queensland was always the most genetically different to everything else. And just this afternoon, um, I've had a look at some crosses that I did with from Queensland in the Bunya Mountains with things from Tasmania, with things from Victoria and South Australia. And you have all these compatible reactions. Black is a compatible reaction. Red is an incompatible reaction. Some of these red uh, ones, I'm not sure when you see a long red, it's a little bit of a surprise to me. I really was crossing um, things in the same, uh, with the same allele to make sure that they didn't cross. So it's always a surprise. I think I might have to go back and look at these a little bit more closely. But yeah, Australia has a rich diversity of mating alleles. And things from the Bunyan Mountains that are really genetically different to things in Tasmania can cross, which may support that Psilocybe subaruginosa is one a uh, big species that has these disjunct populations or phenotypes that have been introduced to the Northern Hemisphere and then been described as new species. Um, how long do I have? 10, 20? Oh my gosh. Uh, I think I want to do justice to this. This structure plot is of cubes. Pretty much it really made me think about the difference ecologically between cubes and subs. So, and it's right here in this Talabudra. This is actually temporal sampling. Since I started in 2020, 2021, 2022, I've made collection sequence genomes. And over time, the same genotype doesn't occur. So the way that I think of cubes now is that they're shedding spores, cows eat them, goes through a cow, comes out in a nitrogen carbon rich environment. It colonizes manure uh, fruits and that genotype is ephemeral. After that manure disappears or that mycelium disappears, that genotype is gone forever, but the next lot of spores is ready to get hoovered up by a bunch of cows or, or mammals eating, eating grass. Subs are the opposite. Subs are forever. They're perennial. They, that genotype is persistent over time and space. It means that if you've gone to a sub patch in 2023, 2022, 2021, whenever, who knows how far back in time, you're visiting the same mushrooms. You're visiting an old friend that's the same genotype every time you visit it. So cool. So just the comparison of those two things is like an annual plant to a perennial plant, cubes and subs. Okay, the last thing I really want to talk about is just about the developments in woodlubber's paralysis and looking at the psilocybin uh, diversity, the diversity of the psilocybin locus in subaruginosa. So just a little bit of background, of course, tryptophan and amino acid is metabolized into psilocybin by these four genes, Psi D, Psi H, Psi K, and Psi M. That's in every magic mushroom has this pathway. Uh, and then some other enzymes, Psi P removes a phosphate group from psilocybin to turn it into psilocin. Psilocin then polymerizes, it joins together to make that bluing reaction. And that's a reversible reaction. And you can imagine that along the way, if you've got more expressed PsiD, you might end up having a higher concentration of tryptamine. Or when you start to change the function of these enzymes, things might start to happen. And that's kind of what we were looking at, I think, at the end of last year and that I've shared with you before. So this is a gene map of the psilocybin locus comparing our wood lovers, so subs, and then a cube at the top. So subs differ to cubes. Cubes have a gene inversion of Psi T and Psi K. Subs are going in whatever, the other direction. And then subs have three homologues of Psi H. And in the genes we, the genomes we looked in here, these three, uh, well, Psi H3, this third gene was probably a pseudo gene. It had a premature stop code on, but it was still annotated as a gene. So Psi H, is the gene that metabolizes tryptamine into 4-hydroxytryptamine. And when you have additional copies of a gene or an enzyme floating around, 
and the function is already taken care of, it can innovate, it can start doing other things to compounds. And since I've been talking to some of my colleagues who are working on neurons and serotonin receptors, it's really got me thinking. So humans have those 14, at least 14 serotonin receptors and psilocin has an affinity to particular ones, but it can also bind to, to other receptors. And what I found interesting was that um, serotonin receptors occur in the peripheral nervous system and uh, they have been linked to things like the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, so shaking. And I just thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if an analog of 4-hydroxytryptamine or tryptamine was binding to a peripheral serotonin receptor to cause a paralysis? Anyway, let's have a look at what we were looking for. So in those 86 genomes, there was about six that had a functional copy of Psi-H3. And those are the six isolates that I will be looking at, sending to a chemist, I won't be doing it, to um, have a look at the metabolites that are being produced. So across those 86 genomes of psilocybe subaeruginosa, there is a lot of diversity at the psilocybin locus. So it's kind of uh, shaped by population. So something in the Bunya Mountains is producing psilocybin at uh, or has very genetic variation. That genetic variation could translate to different things, such as upregulation of one gene over another, better transcription. Uh, who knows? This it's just genetic innovation over time. So even though the end product is psilocin, maybe there's something else going on in the pathway based on differences, genetic differences. The six genomes that had wood lovers paralysis, I know that five of them, are this little cluster here, so things that were collected in Clifton Hill by Kane and Bill in Geelong. And I'm not sure where the last one is, but yeah, super interesting. So some of those wood chips that Kane and Bill were looking in uh, were potential wood lovers, in, in my opinion. And I'm going to leave it there. I'm sorry that it's been so rushed, but yeah, thanks, Emily. Good one. Thank you very much, Alistair. And I, I told you, um, it's, you know, kinky stuff about mushrooms. We are going to do some Q&A now. Uh, thanks for sticking around, a epic, um, but appropriately timed uh, mushroom-themed uh, 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 broadcast for you tonight. Um, can I just get all of our guests to turn on their screens and those who will not be on screen turning off their screens? Um, and I will wait for them to do so. And it's looking pretty good. Let's let's go have a look. Hey, it's the Brady Bunch. Oh, and a wizard hiding, not hiding that well. Um, okay, well, uh, we have a whoa, a big list of questions. Thank you to everybody who has been uh, dropping them in. We really appreciate the uh, conversation ongoing in the chat. Um, do remember that um, uh, this, you know, it's a it's a public forum. Do treat it like a public forum. Um, do uh, um, appreciate that uh, it it sticks around. Um, you know, I think it's a uh, high time that we got rid of the uh, the attitude that we grew up with as uh, you know. Uh, preteen boys trolling and doing silly things on the internet in the 90s. Sorry, I'm sp uh, talking to a very specific audience there, but I feel like we should have got over that by now. Um, I'm just going to find myself. Um, I seem to have disappeared as well. Um, hmm. um, I think it's that one. Oh, too much me. Oh, my God. Nah. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just... Um, I'm just going to go to the first question um, that I have here. Um, thank you very much to our EGA volunteers who have been uh, carefully taking down your questions during tonight's uh, broadcast. The first question is for Vince. Uh, Vince, what have you found regarding neuro uh, neurotrophic factors with microdosing? Um, it's actually got about six questions in here. I don't know if that's meant to be one. Oh, no, I see. I get it now. I get the system. That's the first question, Vince. Do you need me to repeat it? <laughs> uh, no, I've got it. I've got it, I think. So this is asking about um, some of the, the blood-based biomarkers that we're doing in our microdosing research. So I guess I should just say off the bat that I'm not really an expert in this area. I've got some collaborators who are helping me with this part of it. But the idea is that um, there are kind of physiological markers that can be analyzed in blood that 
show indicators of mental health or mental wellness. And there's been a little bit of research in this kind of area with high dose psychedelics and also one previous study with microdosing that showed that one uh, biomarker called BDNF um, had some indications that at some low doses of LSD, there, there might be an increase. And so um, in the neuroimaging study that I talked a little bit about, that kind of second study in my presentation, um, as well as the, the MEG brain scans, we do also have these blood-based biomarkers, but I don't have the results of any of that yet. We've got all of the blood samples kind of lined up and we'll start doing those analyses probably about a month from now once we get those last participants in. So, so I have no idea what we found yet. We've got the samples, but we, we haven't looked at the data, so I can't really answer your question, I'm afraid. Uh uh, a question for Simon now. Is it possible to pre-measure uh, psilocybin in different uh, cubes, cubensis? No. <laughs> Good uh, answer. Not really. Yeah. Um, hence, actually, I mean, that's... Hence homogenizing a batch, I think, is, is the way to go there. Um, I, I think that's uh, that's probably something that's um, important. I hear a lot of people claiming uh, certain, um, uh, especially with lsd maybe not as much with psilocybin though i have heard it among the overly confident and definitely information less um uh crowds at times where people will claim it's this or that that's a that's a marketing thing they're just trying to sell something and it has little if anything to do with the reality of the product in front of you god capitalist language uh, language uh question for siobhan is there a video playlist available on therapeutic trips uh online somewhere uh in terms of music uh johns hopkins has uh released their playlists on spotify you can also find some good ones that are just titled psilocybin got some really beautiful music on there yeah, they mentioned the uh, John Hopkins one and uh, and said uh, the the go to one, but I suppose that would probably be the uh, the Johns Hopkins. Although um, I, it it seems a, a debatable area over what is you know appropriate music because I suppose just because you have mushrooms doesn't mean your tastes homogenize into one. Uh, yeah, it's very, very true. Like sometimes you can give people options in terms of different playlists. Um, there's another one as well that I was introduced to recently. It started with an M and there were three different uh, playlists. I can't remember the name, but it was quite good. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of making my own playlists. So maybe if you are uh... Do you have some time, choose all your favorite songs and try to categorize them by the feeling that it gives your goosebumps. Um, another question, a question for Kane. Um, can psilocybe semilanciata uh, be cultivated? Uh, potentially, yes. Uh, if someone has uh, cultivated it, uh, I know there's a shroomery post about this. So there's definitely the potential to be able to do that. Uh, but then, of course, you know, like within Australia, psilocybin is, is well, it would be still Schedule 9 uh, under cultivation law. And I think this is an important thing to point out. Uh, it would be considered manufacturer if you do a go ahead and, and try to cultivate, you know. We're all talking about Schedule 8, Schedule 9, still illegal in the context of, of growing and foraging. Um, look, uh, I think many fungi can be cultivated. They just, you require the right cultural, uh, quite the right environment to be able to, to cultivate them. Uh, it requires a good understanding of the species, uh, their needs. Um, I feel that they can. Um, it's just that they do seem to be very, very difficult to to cultivate. But uh, I think in the context of the Quentin's question, it's also important to point out that in Australia, it's manufacture. In most countries, it's still manufacture. I, I've actually heard some rather anarchic growing stories from uh, some some people I know 
uh, who have managed to cultivate not not uh, similar Enciata, but uh, uh, Subaruginosa um, successfully by just kind of winging it, um, just putting some bits and pieces in a, a suitable environment and um, crossing fingers and toes. And what do you know? Mushrooms in a pot. But um, um, look, you know, like there's many, many species and Subaruginosa is one of them. It can be quite weedy in their potential. You know, like you, you spread the, the mycelium around, you spread the, the matter around, it's just going to grow. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's incredibly adventitious species. And, um, you know, and, and hence, I think probably, um, hence why it's, it's spread over the world. It's just like it's gone traveling with, with other, with other plants, you know, when plants have been shipped overseas to other places. And there are some um, uh, infamous stories of, I believe, during the 60s and 70s, uh, some of Melbourne's university campuses being uh, sporified, <laughs> seeded? No, sporified. Um, uh, to this day, I, I hear a little um, birdie tells me. Uh, a question oh, for... I can tell you, uh, University of Tasmania is another location. <laughs> seems a common location. That and uh, any wood-chipped area that exists um, yeah. seem to be targets. Uh, another question for you, Vince. Uh, Vince, um, uh, can can people sign up for any of your psychedelic studies? I believe you said they could, but maybe... Yeah, yeah. Information. Um, the study I mentioned at the end, people planning to take a psychedelic. So this is a observational study when we're not providing psychedelics for that one but if anyone is planning to take a psychedelic they can they can definitely sign up and so the url there is um it's a bitly address bit.ly forward slash mq psychedelic survey um and that will take you to that one um for the clinical trial that we're planning we're not um we're not open for volunteers for that one yet and that will be um, the pathway into that will be a referral through a GP or some other medical professional. Um, but yes, not set up to take uh, volunteers for that one just yet. That will be starting shortly. Can I, can I grab that URL once more? Was it MQ Psychedelic Survey or one word? Yes, that's right. MQ uh, Bitly. Um, I got an error. I'm probably doing it wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, hang on. Dot com. Oh. Anyway, um, um, thank you, thank you. I'll, I'm just trying to get that to work for me so I can put it up on a screen. Um, not capable right now. Another question for um, oh, how how far do these go? Um, Kane, another question for you. Are there any big pharma companies growing um psilocybe mushrooms on large scale yet in Australia? Uh, I'm not sure how large the scale is, uh, but there was certainly a media release that came out recently that uh i think who is it is it little green farmer uh is looking at going ahead and it's through their their mycology side company is looking at going ahead with with cultivating psilocybe cubensis uh for i guess that initial phase of um yeah preparing for for um access to, to psilocybin um, another question for Vince. Sorry, I'm I'm just looking through this list and looking for names. Um, and there there's uh, a lot targeted towards uh, a few, but I'll try and come up with some. And again, drop them into the uh, into the chat here on YouTube if you have a question. Still, we don't have too long left because it is getting very late, um, especially after so many hours of broadcasting. But Vince, um, is uh, lion's mane and niacin useful to combine? With psilocybin microdosing, is that a useful stack? Is that what the cool kids call it? A stack? Yeah, there there is a couple of papers suggesting that. Paul Stamets is on a, a couple of papers with researchers out of um, University of British Columbia, and they um, they are reporting that lion's mane and niacin combined with psilocybin um, seems to um, have a greater impact than psilocybin alone and they reported if i recall correctly that that was particularly for um uh cognition in older adults um was their most striking finding for the um the the, the added impact of, of stacking compared to microdosing alone it's just yeah i mean it's just one paper really that's looked at the the stack question and so 
Um, I'd say promising indication, but I don't know if I would fully bet on that just yet. Um, yeah, the link does work. I just was typing it in wrong. So that's MQ Psychedelic Survey. I don't know. It shouldn't matter, Caps, but uh, it was a capital MQ. Um, that shouldn't matter anymore, but um, sometimes it does. Uh, yes, Ronnie is lurking behind me. Where are you now? Suspicious. A um, couple more questions. Uh, we've asked that one. We've asked that one. Uh, do different oh yeah i mean this i feel like uh, I, do different strains provide different effects and that one's for alistair oh man good question i wish i knew um <laughs> kane shaking his head i i don't know uh keep in mind that all the strains are so genetically similar that uh there's not really any diversity at the psilocybin locus in psilocybe cubensis among those strains. Hence the expression, a cube is a cube. If you watch another entheogenesis talk I did, keep in mind a banana is a banana. Genetic diversity underpins uh, anything, any difference that you experience in flavor, in, um, in, in life, in agriculture. So will genetic diversity translate to differences? to an entourage who knows i i feel like uh people often describe uh different mushrooms in different ways on the uh online forums but again that sort of draws me back to that like um i don't know i find it I find it really difficult to understand uh other people's experiences um at one of one of you before i can't remember which one um was taught talking about visualizing i think it might have been you alistair visualizing a um uh uh a, a, an object can't remember what it was it was in relation to your topic um and i only recently discovered that not everybody um thinks that the word visualize is a metaphor for like the brain stuff that you do and that boggles my mind and that feels like a simple thing i think uh in terms of the qualia of a psychedelic experience uh <laughs> how do you compare difficult well i guess uh we we ask vince those sorts of uh questions or um and then we ask the genetic things to alistair maybe we'll ask some can, cultivation can ones. i maybe just jump in and maybe add something Thank to you. that Alistair, that um the the penis envy lineages in the psilocybin cup that some people over in america did recently were significantly more potent but that was just looking at psilocybin and there's interesting stuff around trace levels of some hamala monoamine oxidase inhibitors in some psilocybes as well as potentially some terpenes um and in terms of the different species, people anecdotally definitely report that there might be some different in the difference in the nature of the experience. But because that's been so widely propagated um, within the culture, there's a lot of potential for placebo as well um, in the idea that subs might produce like a slightly darker experience and that cues might be happier and that pan might be even happier than that. So how to separate that placebo from that cultural belief that's been propagated for so long now from actual scientific basis for difference in effect, I think is probably going to be quite difficult moving forward without like blinded trials and, um, you know, really intensive chemical analysis as well. I do remember earlier in the uh, chat, somebody was claiming that uh, psilocybin can be used for mind control. And this uh, conversation is sort of uh, reminding me of uh, of that comment, which um, I, I, I don't believe it is a mind control drug, but um, I, I guess there is that sort of malleable state um, that one might, uh, might find themselves in. Um, yeah, I just wanted to... I mentioned there were a few uh, lots of uh lots of interesting uh chats uh in there um always be wary of what you think you know i think that's one of the best things i can say just watching some of the chat there have been some really um uh excellent co uh, comments and interesting speculation um but uh, i've found in my time hanging around psychedelic types uh there does uh me being one there does tend to be a variety of us uh um, some on the um, on the uh, I'm going to accept, uh, accept uh, any idea that is you know give me the loopiest and it's mine. Um, just be careful. I think, like I said, I think that 
your sensory array is easily tricked. And remember that. Um, there's not too many more questions. Have I missed one? Yeah, I think it's it's pretty late. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists for this um, epic mushroom broadcast. I hope you have a wonderful sleep tonight. Enjoy the autumn weather at the moment because today was just... Uh, for Melbourne anyway, I don't know about the rest of you. Um, and we appreciate you being on our first webcast uh, here at the EGA YouTube channel for 2023. So um, a round of applause. It'll just it'll just be me. Hey, where did everyone everyone go? Something funny's going on here. <laughs> um, that's everyone. I'm sorry, I don't know how that happened. Did I lean on something? Here's everyone. And thank you very much. Thank you. And that's about all we have time for, or, well, all, all we have uh, mind for this evening. You can find more videos, more information, information sheets, resources, guides, all sorts of things at the EGA website, entheogenesis.org. And I think I can... Um, thumbs up. Maybe it's saying it somewhere here. Uh, nope, it's going to take a while to cycle back around. One of our EGA mods will drop it into the YouTube chat and you'll probably be able to easily enough find it on the YouTube channel. Make sure to subscribe to the newsletter when you head over to the website. Uh, updates about what videos are being made available uh, uh, sent out regularly. There is a catalogue, not just of recent conferences, but I know that there is a backlog of uh, some interesting uh, conference content from over a decade ago, I believe. I, th I think there's um, just bags full of tapes and SD cards and all sorts of media transfer devices uh, that are lying around and haven't quite been explored enough yet. Um, and that means there's always more content coming and we will uh, have another microdose webcast we don't know the theme yet and we haven't got a date won't be monthly at the moment but there are some other plans brewing so keep your eye out for us thanks very much have a lovely night and yeah press this one i'm gonna fix these buttons <laughs>